And at one time, became rather infamous, but I don't want to go into that here. Yesterday, we observed him and our leaders paying respects to him as the Grand Chief, as the Privy Councillor of the Queen as an international uh, politician of, uh, of, of uh, outstanding stature uh, 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 and, and it was solemn. In the chamber too was the Governor General, uh, uh, Grand Chief uh, Bob Dadai, uh, and we had uh, the Chief Justice and his 40 judges. Okay, and we have footages coming live out of the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium at Konedobu. The Prime Minister, Honorable James Marape, and his wife, Lady Rachel, have entered the stadium. Also there are some members of Parliament and VIPs. These are pictures coming live. So the stadium was filled up to capacity as early as 8.30 a.m., I believe. We have students in uniform. We also have members of the general public. A lot of them have turned out in black. It is, of course, public holiday nationwide today. Friday, the 12th of March, 2021. Sad day indeed, Mr. Eyafere. Yes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It is really a, a sad day and a sol solemn occasion. Uh, and being Catholic, uh, uh, my colleague Frank will uh, elaborate on the actual ceremony itself. But uh, it's significant in that uh, recognition is given to him in this very elaborate uh, ritual, which uh, is uh, typical of uh, heads of state or heads of government uh, who have shown throughout their lives a commitment to the Roman Catholic faith. Uh, and uh, in fact, yesterday's tributes, uh, if might I ha add to what uh, Mr. Colmer has said, is that there is, firstly, uh, you, you cannot really express in fullness Everybody added to the mosaic of the different commentaries that came, the, the different accolades that he was given. Uh, and I think one thing that was significant is his spirit of honesty and his spirit of forgiveness that came out throughout. People gave testimonies of, uh, leaders gave testimony of their, of their lives and the, their encounter and, and, and uh, the way in which he was quick to forgive, which is, as I explained yesterday in yesterday's broadcast, uh, typical of Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit, gentleness, self-control. And I think what, one thing that was missing, which I, I felt uh, would have been an ordinary inclusion in any such gathering, is the foreign minister's statement that would have included condolence messages from foreign governments uh, and international organizations. And I thought it would have been fitting that while he lay, whilst he lay in, in state, uh, that foreign governments who are close to Papua New Guinea and who have traveled the journey in his 49 years of politics with him uh, could easily have been given uh, an opportunity through the uh, foreign minister to express words of condolences. And it would have taken up at least a good portion of his statement. But nonetheless, I think uh, they would have also come in numbers had we not had the COVID-19 restrictions. Mm, definitely. Uh, Mr. Colma, if you can come in here. Um, two weeks of house crime. So much has been said about the man, not only from Port Mosby, not only from leaders, but there have been small house cries that were held um, around the country as well. It goes to show that Grand Chief was indeed a uh, the people's man, the people's leader. In, indeed, and today is that day when we uh, receive him and pay tribute to him as the people's man. Yesterday we received him and paid respects in our grand hall, in our uh, House of Legislature 
as the politician, as the international statesman, as the Queen's Privy Councillor, and today we honour him as our papa, yes. as a husband, as the son and also the father of, uh, 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 of the nation. And, 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 and this, is, this is grand because we, he was more than anything an icon recognised anywhere. So my name, more than any other politician, will be known from wherever you are in Papua New Guinea and in the Pacific. And, and today is another special day also that was not very obvious in the public life of uh, 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 Sir Michael, and that is Sir Michael, the spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. He was very much a spiritual leader, yeah. uh, uh, and he, he observed his Catholic faith religiously every Sunday, very ever so quietly. He would come into St. Joseph's Paris, St. Joseph's Church, with Lady Veronica, take their place, observe the Holy Mass, and then leave after a few pleasantries with you know uh, people who were gathered there, then leave quietly. Mm -hmm. He never preached his faith, but in the way he lived his life, he was so terribly, terribly uh, religious. And, and it is a great and grand honor to, to actually pay him respect in this manner, to say goodbye in this manner uh, by having a uh, uh, hosting a holy mess at the stadium mm -hmm. where he received and brought independence, the very stadium where he brought independence into the country, Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. Yes, indeed. Uh, Peter, you mentioned a very important point there, the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. Um, I believe it's the first time it's going to be in use after refurbishment. Yes. Um, but it's not a new stadium. It's, uh, it has held and witnessed a lot of and hosted a lot of um, important events in the history of this country. One of them, the most important one, being the lowering of the uh, Australian flag in nine, on September 16, 1975. And we can see students there in their uniforms right now, together with the general public adorning um, some form of PNG colors, PNG clothes, school carrying uniform. yes, school uniform, mm -hmm. the PNG flag. Of of course, a huge flag has been draped over the semi curtain grandstand. Very symbolic, very symbolic time and place indeed. Well, 46 years ago, I sat there as a student from Sugeri. We all came down to in busloads, and they put us in all our provincial. Uh, uh, colours and, uh, and uh, we also witnessed the lowering of the flag and as I said la yesterday, in yesterday's broadcast uh, for me uh, there's a lot of regret in that they did not preserve the original dares upon which the flag was lowered or the f flagpoles and also the actual Hubert Murray Stadium itself uh, as part of our legacy as part of our heritage uh, and that it identifies with the fact that a, an occasion as important as uh, a country being birthed mm -hmm. was, uh, was, was, took place there. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, the House of Assembly, as I said early, yesterday, um, was not also preserved in the original form. And, you know, you could build around it. And, uh, the example I gave yesterday was the Sydney Cricket Grounds, mm -hmm. where you could have easily, uh, they have actually built around the old, sta old stand. So while you modernize, you also preserve what is historical uh, and significant uh, to the growth of the, our nation. Governor General. Okay, entering now the stadium <coughs> is the Governor General, Grand Chief Sir Bob Dadai and Lady Yes. Professor Isi Kevao and Ila Jena. Professor Isi Kevao, I can see as well. Oh, yeah. Members of Parliament have already been seated. This uh, uh, holy mess today is presided over by Cardinal John Wibat. He uh, has been 
He is the country's first cardinal, uh, uh, and a cardinal is one of those people, bishops normally, who uh, elects the pope when a pope passes away. So we've had the honor of uh, uh, having a cardinal and the first cardinal named here in the lifetime of uh, Sir Michael, and it was uh, Cardinal Ribat, Sir uh, John Ribat, who actually presided over and gave him the last, what we Catholics call the last holy orders, which is a special blessing to prepare you for, you know, your, 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 your way to uh, Christ Jesus and God. And, and, and he did that at the Pacific uh, International Hospital as he lay on his, on his bed. So uh, the special man, has, uh, he, he has uh, lived through so much, he's seen so much, and spiritually he's, uh, he's been, you can liken him to, to Moses leading uh, Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery because that's, uh, he did as, as, as good a job as Moses did to our people, so many diverse people enslaved by, by ignorance and, 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 and to have brought us out like that spiritual leader did. He was also our spiritual leader. On the way, he stopped to give us guidance and, 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 and our rules and regulations, our constitutions very much in the same way as Moses did with the Ten Commandments and the rules and regulations for the state or for the people of Israel as described in Leviticus. So he's been our spiritual leader and it is very fitting that we should offer uh, him a uh, holiness uh, uh, on his. Yes, um, and as we heard all the um, the condolence messages and the words of acknowledgement and and thanks yesterday at the uh, at the parliament during his lying state, you get the sense and you feel that you know he was such a dy dynamic person, national leader. He was someone who could make deals um, on the international world stage. With, uh, with powerhouse leaders, but he was also uh, a father. He was also a family man, and he was also able to go and um, sit with his tribesmen and women, sit around the fire back uh, in, his, in his home village. So he was such a dynamic person, Mr. Airfairy. Um, he, you, you mentioned... Um, some of his titles uh, yesterday, but yeah. if maybe you can mention that yeah. again today. Yes. Um, in fact, um, as, as I explained, uh, uh, the first title, which is the GCL, uh, is the uh, Grand, uh, Grand Chief of the Order of Logohu, which is a, 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 the order that he himself uh, uh, decided to create. Now, I can vouch for the fact that I did the initial running around in collecting similar orders and we basically relied on the Order of Australia uh, how, uh, how to also uh, construct our own. Uh, but Sir Frederick uh, Raiha took full, full uh, carriage of that. Okay, um, and then also um, the, the second order which he had is the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. Joseph. Uh, St. George, which is one of the four uh, orders that he has received from the Queen. Uh, this is really uh, uh, next to uh, uh, the uh, highest uh, in, in, the, in the land, uh, that's uh, in, in the Queen's order. Uh, he's also got a CH, which is the Order of the Companion of Honours, uh, awarded by the Queen. And then he's also got a PC, which is a uh, an invitation that's given to uh, leaders. Uh, the original concept upon why the Privy Council order is given is that it's Her Majesty's most honorable Privy Council. And in the old days when this was um, introduced, uh, Lord Cromwell, uh, uh, who was then the Lord Protector of England, provide, uh, provide, created this so that they would provide advice to the, the ruling monarch so they were privileged people who were called in from all walks of life, who provided advice. Uh, and to these modern times, they are giving it to uh, leaders of the Commonwealth 
uh, who, which, of which the Queen is the head of state. But uh, that is the original concept upon which the Privy Council, they do not meet regularly as they did in, in the old times or the medieval times uh, or since the creation of this. He's also got what is significant for t this occasion, um, or before I go there, uh, is the, the Knight of uh, St. John's. Uh, he is the Knight of Justice and Grace of the Venerable Order of the Hospital of St. John's of Jerusalem. So that, that's the full length of what the KSTJ stands for. But the one that's significant today is the Knight of the uh, Knight, Knight of uh, St. Gregory the Great. And St. Gregory was the uh, Pope, the 16th Pope, uh, who instituted this on the 1st of September, 1831. And that is in recognition of uh, Roman Catholics men and women who've protected the, sea, the Holy See, who've also lived uh, a life that is worthy of spreading the word of Roman Catholics or, or, the, or the word of God through the Roman Catholic Church uh, throughout the ages. So that order is given, uh, is conferred by the Holy See by order of the Pope. So the Pope, uh, current Pope, all would, would be the one that, is, uh, that presides over whether you're granted one or not. So it's an important uh, aspect of it. And it fits well because today uh, we have a Roman Catholic ceremony and, and given his uh, impeccable and I would call a steadfast uh, adherence to his faith as a Catholic. Uh, as was described by Frank earlier on. Yes, and um, we have some more live pictures from the uh, Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. As I mentioned earlier, the stadium is, it looks full, it looks full to capacity. The general public is there. We have school students in the school uniforms ready to uh, pay their final respects to the founding father of this nation a man who had a heart. He, he was, you know, he was not very big in stature, but I mean, he was a giant of a man. He, yes, he was, uh, he, he was likened to a soaring eagle by St. Yeah. Julius yesterday. And, 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 and he was described by Governor Byrd as a colossus walking among men, you know, a colossus is uh, it's, it's, it's a gigantic creature, uh, you know, walking among men. Sure. Uh, this, uh, this is actually what he was. Yeah. But I, I just want to make a short comment on, 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 on the day there. There's uh, uh, something very traditional, very, very, very uh, Papua New Guinean. We like to read the weather. We like to read the atmosphere, the climate. And uh, St. Michael's funeral, over the last few weeks, you will see that it has been good somber days, not terribly bright, uh, traditional, but must be sunny, uh, simmering hot days. But just, you know, a little, a, 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 a little like, if you will, the sun extinguishing itself so that you can have a good day. And then at the end of the funeral services and of the visitations by the various provincial groups, there was always that rain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and last night, if you will, there was this day, and, and, and then at the end it came in waves, in torrents. Mm -hmm. and, and, and leading on to this day, I could almost predict tonight there will be a downpour, you know, and, and, and this, is, this is nature saying goodbye in its own way as mm. well, you know. True. Like you said yesterday, mm. uh, Peter, it's like nature is responding mm. to what's happening today. Yes, um, um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not a superstition, but it's a belief in, mm. in my culture that when, when a person dies and then suddenly we have tide coming into the house, it's almost an act of wiping out his or her footprints. So in a way, yesterday, uh, the deluge that ha happened, and maybe tonight, uh, we're not predicting the weather, but 
uh, it seems highly likely there's a build-up on the <laughs> on the coast. So we may see that kind of act, which, which symbolizes the fact that uh, he is no longer there. One thing I noticed uh, um, uh, within the two weeks of mourning that was going on uh, is some description of how people were in black clothes uh, with their... Fa that looks like Sana. Yes. And of Lady no, Veronica. Uh, sorry, so, Arthur. Yeah. Arthur. Arthur. <coughs> yes. Yes, uh, as, as I was saying, um, that uh, especially I noticed, uh, yes, Lady Veronica is in there. Lady Veronica has entered the Sehivet Mari Stadium with, accompanied by her children, and I believe those are members of the girl guys. Yes. As well. Sana. And we are waiting for the motorcade. The motorcade is scheduled to depart the funeral home at Erima at half past one. Just, just below 10 minutes. And we'll see, we'll have the motorcade um, come towards the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. Who is so maybe very deep at the uh into into this ceremony in a wheelchair it, uh, it is you know good to to note that both of them have been sick together and uh, you know they I think they went to Australia for treatment together and one of the things that uh, that, that is one of the most moving moments that was captured in a photograph that I saw was when they held hands together in the uh, sick bed, uh, yes. And uh, they've they've been together uh, since uh, they were married, and that is something that you do not see in Papua New Guinea leaders. Not many of them. There's some some real great ones, but Sir Michael is this leader that we are uh, talking of as, as 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 our champion and as our founding prime minister. Uh, I mean, no got what we would call passing big man, where money looking money na, I mean, kissing power na, I mean, looking high office na, I mean, looking money and by thinking lo one plus more mama or this la kaina. For this man, he's been faithful and loyal to his wife through all his life, and and she was the, at his bedside when. Uh, when he said goodbye, and this is something terribly, terribly important for Papua New Guinea as we, you know, witness this funeral. This little justice of his that I'd call made him the spiritual leader of our country as well. <coughs> True words there, um, Frank. So this, this uh, image is coming out again from the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. The Sir Hubert Murray Stadium, it's actually built on reclaimed land. Yes. It's it, renamed. it was opened, um, it was renamed? Yeah, Sir Mick Curtin, who had oh, no, it's the grandstand. The grandstand. <laughs> it was opened in uh, 1969 for the 1969 South Pacific Games. Um, and like I said, it's a historical location. Yes, Lady Veronica, surrounded by her children, Dalciana, Arthur, Sana. We are a nation in mourning. It is a public holiday today around the country, um, with a lot of small, similar events uh, taking place. I have seen um, a lot of posts on social media. Um, there have been like little memorials set up. I, I see some um, in, East New, um, in New Island, East New Britain province as well. People taking time out today, this public holiday, to remember the Grand Chief, the founding father of the country. He lived to 84, but like I said, he could have been 184. He's accomplished so many things in his lifetime. And he's seen the country through 45 years of uh, independence. 
And I believe it's something that he would have been very proud yeah, of. Yeah. Yes. He's had a considerable and significant um, contributions to our country, apart from bringing about the Constitution. Uh, his first foreign policy act was uh, the, uh, the foreign policy of uh, approach of uh, universalism, which mean, meant uh, friends to all and enemies to none. And I think what is significant in that is that it set the platform upon which later policy approaches would sort of evolve from. So when we came into 91, when the change of government happened in 1980, uh, it was clear that Sir Julius was built on his foreign policy approach. He also followed, uh, provided the, uh, the first foreign policy review and also spoke of the active and selective engagement. Lady Veronica Somari has been seated by, Sana. by her son, Sana. We do thank her and her children, the Somari family, for being able to share their father, this, this great man whose life we are celebrating today. To Solomon solemn, solemn occasion. Yes, in, in uh, the in the choir there, uh, every parish in Port Mosby has been asked to contribute 20 members to join the uh, choir here. So the St. Joseph's uh, Parish is leading the choir, but in it, uh, 20 members from every parish, Catholic parish in, in Port Mosby. Joining this uh, choir to lead the, uh, today's holy mass. <clears throat> yes, and uh, Frank, like you said, today's um, mass is going to be presided over by His Eminence Cardinal Sir John Ribat, Archbishop of Port Moresby. Um, of course, uh, the Cardinal Sir John Ribat was. He was created Cardinal in 2016 by Pope Francis, but he's been the Archbishop of Port Mosby since 2008. So he's been, been doing the job for a, a, a long time. We're, we're so terribly proud that he's been made a Cardinal, uh, and, and now he preside over this uh, Holy Mass uh, 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 as a Parting tribute to our founding father, uh, what a fitting occasion. Uh, I expect that bishops would have been drawn from many parts of the country uh, uh, if they had been allowed by COVID restrictions <coughs> to come. You would see the entire stadium or that uh, uh, grandstand uh, filled with, uh, with, with, with bishops. Uh, even from the Solomon Islands, which uh, is part of the Papua New Guinea uh, and, and Solomon Bishops uh, Conference. So they would have come as well, were it not for the uh, COVID restrictions. But there's a fair number of them there with their little cupolas or the heads there. They would be bishops. Okay. We are waiting for the motorcade the casket to depart the funeral home mm. um, to the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. And uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that to happen, um, Mr. Eafiare, mm. you spent you know, a fair amount of time as a diplomat. Um, what, was, what are your thoughts about um, the views that other leaders in the region had towards the Grand Chief? Well, let me also continue from where I left off in, in terms of the foreign policy approach that he did, because that was when, when we had universal, universalism, it was the basis upon which we were able to build other uh, uh, subsequent uh, foreign policy approaches, uh, one of which was Sir Julius's coining of the phrase uh, active and selective engagement. And that was significant. but. There was only, uh, in 1975, we only had relations with Australia, Fiji, New Zealand, Indonesia, Japan, Philippines, Denmark, 
the UK and the USA. But as soon as we spelled out how we were going to engage with each of uh, these nations, and the interest is mutual, really, uh, we were able to enter into relations in 1976 with China, India, Malaysia, North Korea, and 20 other countries. But what is significant is the relationship with China is the only country that we have a joint communique that clearly spells out one China, one policy, and Somalia agreed to that. Because Somalia was thinking of a future that we may engage more free, uh, closely and fruitfully with China. And he wasn't wrong, because China has now emerged as one of the leading countries that is involved in the, especially the infrastructure and the economy of uh, quite a number of countries, although uh, there are significant uh, issues that uh, relate to that relationship. But it, it was how, and on that visit that I went with him in 2004, they just admired the way in which he had continue, continued to have uh, an unbroken democracy right throughout. The Chinese will tell you that they do have a, a, a democratic process, uh, but it has Chinese characteristics, mm -hmm. which is clearly what our own uh, Grand Chief was doing with our country that, in that most of what he followed was a good sense of a vision, a visionary, and also somebody who also wanted to embrace those political leaders that he was working with, both mentoring and, and, and providing advice, I mean, uh, leading. So I think the significant aspect of his role as Prime Minister continues to this day. As Foreign Minister, he was revered right throughout the, the, uh, the region, uh, and they saw him as somebody who was close to Ratu Mara, but he had his own mark. And that's the significant difference that he provided. He was Sana, the peacemaker, uh, and he had great forbearance. Two examples. One, he uh, was able to at least uh, talk the countries around in, in the region in 2004 to provide support to uh, Greg Irwin, who was uh, then uh, nominated by Australia to be... Uh, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, sorry, the Forum, Pacific Island Forum. And the second thing that he did was in the Commonwealth, and I witnessed this in 2003 in Abuja, Nigeria. He was the one who rallied the support, and when he spoke, because it was the second term, and the African Caribbeans were trying to put in their own person for the Commonwealth Secretary General to replace Don McKinnon, and Don McKinnon being from the Pacific, from New Zealand, and also a former foreign minister of New Zealand. When Grand Chief spoke and said, it's important for us for purposes of continuity to allow for Don McKinnon to come in. Yes, um, we have on screen. We have on screen the uh, Master of Ceremonies, Honorable Dadi Toka Jr., who is the Motukoita Chairman and Deputy NCD Governor. The grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare, government ministers, members of parliament, governors, diplomatic corps, former governor generals and former prime ministers, distinguished guests, those who are watching and listening throughout Papua New Guinea, children of Papua New Guinea, ladies and gentlemen, let me also acknowledge the traditional owners of this land this event is being hosted, the Motoi Taro people, and recognize the continued connection to land, water, and culture. We pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. My name is Dadi Toka. I will be a master of ceremonies for this momentous occasion as we not only farewell the father of the nation, but also 
celebrate his life. For those that have just joined us at the St. Mary Stadium, please ensure COVID-19 protocols are adhered to. Wear your face mask at all times and please hand sanitize. Ladies and gentlemen, the casket has now left the funeral alone and in a motorcade heading towards St. Mary Stadium. The estimated time of arrival will be 2 p.m. And may I ask when the casket does arrive if we can be all upstanding again. Once the casket arrives, I will hand over the podium to His Eminence and the Catholic Church to conduct the proceedings of today's state funeral program. Thank you for listening. And uh, we are still waiting for the motorcade carrying the casket of the great man, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare, to come from the funeral home at Erima in the nation's capital. And it'll come up the freeway and down to the venue of this uh, state funeral mass, which is the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. Okay, that was um, the Master of Ceremonies, Honorable Daddy Toka Jr., who will be taking charge of the, um, of the program. Daddy Toka Jr., of course, is the uh, chairman of the Motu Koita, as well as uh, deputy NCD governor. So he was welcoming uh, Lady Veronica Somare and uh, the members of the public. Uh, paying his respects and uh, acknowledging the elders, the landowners, and um, we are a nation in mourning, Frank. We are, and uh, it is, it, it, it's particularly uh, important that uh, yesterday the governor for Central uh, addressed his tribute in Motu, I thought that was, uh, that was beautiful and, and, and now to have uh, one of the sons of Motu Koitabu uh, uh, take uh, the lead as the uh, master of ceremonies here. Uh, this, uh, the Motu and side, the people that pop, uh, uh, the Grand Chief united, he was very passionate about them. Mm -hmm. Indeed, he spoke the language uh, uh, as if it were his own. And so to, to have uh, our brothers and sisters, our seniors, uh, take, participate uh, in this manner, it, is, uh, it gladdens the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you see this unity aspect again and again displayed in, in, in di different simple ways, but, uh, symbolic ways. Uh, you, 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 you see, this is the man who brought Papua and New Guinea together. This is the man, as uh, 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 Peter Siamalili Jr. was speaking yesterday, it is the man who brought uh, Bougainville and Papua New Guinea together. Uh, and so you, you see this unity aspect over and over again repeated during this uh, uh, solemn occasion, this uh, uh, a period of uh, mourning, but let's not talk mourning too much. We must also celebrate what this man has done. 
Sure. He's yes. lived his life, a yes. full life. 84 years, from 1936, he's seen the Great Depression, he's seen every war that this world has produced, he's seen so many things, and he's lived through it all, and he's delivered a nation of a, a vibrant democracy. Mm. And, and, and so, as we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, remembering him and feeling sad at this departure, let's also celebrate the fact that he has given up given us all this and in the celebration looking forward I think we can also say let's emulate what he has done. He mm. stayed with one mm. wife and he's, 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 he's been faithful to his church and he doesn't speak church at every statement that he makes. He, this is his private personal matter that, 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 that spirituality is personal and he taught us that and so he wanted uh, political independence, he gave it to us. Uh, and he wished for economic independence. Uh, at that time, he might not have had it. He didn't have the educated Papua New Guineans and, 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 and the politicians with him. But perhaps today we have. So how are we going to realize the economic independence dream that he, yes. has, he has given us? I think those are the things that we can look at. And mm. we can also be happy for, for this man. No? Uh, so rightly put, uh, Frank, it is, mm. it's an end of an era, but it's, it's also a beginning of a new era. Yes, I, I believe so. Uh, and uh, adding on to what uh, Frank has said, uh, it's, it's important to re realize that lessons that are being brought forth in his, in, in, in his life uh, are what that we... Uh, it, we can't necessarily uh, let go because those are the foundational stones that he has, he's setting that we must build upon. Uh, I, I think what is significant also is the leadership that he showed throughout uh, uh, the Pacific region and I gave a few examples of how he intervened. What is more significant for me is when I arrived in Fiji, I arrived before the coup. I lived through the coup and then I left just before the elections happened. But the significant part of it is he showed his sana as the peacemaker characteristic, and he also showed great forbearance. Mm. By that I mean, in sana he said to me, when he rang me, he said to me on one occasion, he said, he said but I said to him, sir, I have already provided all the briefs and, and everything to the foreign minister, uh, and also copied your chief of staff and your deputy chief of staff, who were Paul Dango and Leonard Loma at that time. And he said, no, no, Mila Haram Nek Blue the So, you know, he wanted a personal touch to a situation he saw that was really getting grave in terms of the country that is more or less his second home, and that's Fiji. But what he said to me was just observe in the public announcements and listen to their private conversations. Uh, and one of the things that he was able to do was when, uh, when uh, Dr. Feleti Sevele of Tonga, who was then chair of the, uh, of the forum, asked him if whether the two of them could talk to Baini Marama. Uh, he asked me to organize the venue and we went and he said, I don't want a brief from you, I just want to go and listen to what Bani Marama will say in terms of the appeal that we've given to him concerning an early return to democracy, uh, sorry, yeah, democratic elections. But the Okay, and uh, we are being informed that <coughs> the motorcade bearing the casket of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare has departed the funeral home and it's now on the freeway heading down towards the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. So as you were saying... Um, yes, uh, um, in, in terms of uh, uh, more or less signifying his character as a, a man with great forbearance. And I think uh, there's a few and far between. Um, so. The meeting took place, we came away, there was him, his uh, acting foreign minister, Ratu Akeli Nailatika, the former president of Fiji. Uh, 
and then Savelli, Savelli was quite angry. Well, not angry, but you know, he was disappointed. Let, let me put it that way. But Grand Chief took it calmly, and he said to me, "Son, I'm here. I'm not my man." So you know the great forbearance of the person that he knew ahead of time that there would be something that would come around, and I, and it did. Democratic elections took place, uh, and since then uh, there's a, a, a sense of normalcy being achieved. But he's got that such uh, they pay him re such reverence that Fiji awarded him the Companion of the Order of Fiji when I was High Commissioner, and I witnessed it on his first official visit. He sent me down well in June. Uh, and then he arrived in, in August, on the 25th of August. He was investitured uh, with the Companion of the Order of Fiji, which is the highest order of that land. And in later years, Solomon Islands also awarded him the Star of Solomon, which is also the highest order in that country. So that's just a, a microcosm of the reverence that people felt for him, mm -hmm. uh, even in awe, and you know, wanting to take photos with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I witnessed this especially in Fiji and Solomon Islands. But there you have it. Our Grand Chief, our very own, but also a regional and uh, uh, international leader. Mm. Listening long distance from here, at the time of the coup, there was one thing that struck me. Uh, uh, I think this is because of the leadership provided by Sir Michael. And, and that is, you know, uh, when the uh, countries of the Commonwealth and particularly in the uh, Forum Nations, uh, Australia and New Zealand, when we voted to expel uh, New Zealand, uh, sorry, Fiji, you know, I think Papua New Guinea abstained or played the midi mediation role here. Yeah. And, 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 and then when Fiji sought friendship amongst us, it was always to Papua New Guinea that. And, 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 Peter, you have to correct me yes. because you, you, you were closer to this. But it was, it was to us that they always deferred. I can vouch for that, Frank. And thank you for reminding me. You see, the fact is, uh, the forum called for a, um, a leadership uh, meeting in, in Port Moresby, and we hosted it, although we were not the chair. Mm -hmm. uh, we hosted it, and that's in uh, 2006. Uh, sorry, 2007, because 2006 was the... Uh, and uh, and um, the significance of which was that President Anote Tong of, of Kiribati wanted to go for a vote because he was so annoyed that Bani Marama sent uh, Ayaz Sayad Kayum rather than come himself. So that was already a slap in the face uh, for them. But Grand Chief stood firm. He said, no, no, no. We have to respect the fact that we always have a gentleman's agreement. We do not go to vote on things like this. And this was to expel Fiji. Uh, but it was under the Bikitawa Declaration. They were only able to uh, suspend him. Uh, because we did not, because the Bikitawa is fashioned about, uh, under the, um, the um, Harara Declaration, which calls for strict expulsion, uh, suspension to expulsion, three strikes and you're out kind of stuff. But uh, what was also uh, significant was that he, he wanted to allow for this. And the second uh, occurrence was at, uh, at uh, Wava'u when we went for, I, he and I attended the retreat. And he saw me go up to talk to Helen Clark and Greg Irwin and all the uh, uh, Australian uh, dignitaries and, and forum officials, and he and Bani Marama were sitting at the back of the, of the conference room. And I didn't know he was seething with anger because he was watching uh, Helen Clark's gestures. Uh, this is public television, so I won't say what Helen Clark actually said. But when I went back, he said, You blow the toe on him. We said, No, no, talk to us long, situation long, Fiji, na. I said, yeah, it's like Bikula Mary and Mogi Manam. He said, sir, uh, I think I, I would rather that we, you and I discuss this outside. Because Mania Sinantuna, you know, straight, I'm not going to lie. Okay. 
Okay, and um, the motorcade bearing the casket of the Grand Chief is now at Burns Peak. And Burns Peak is the last hill before the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. So we should be expecting an entrance into the stadium in less than five minutes. Um, Frank, you've, uh, you've witnessed a lot of uh, significant events at that venue. Maybe if you can search your memory, your memory bank. Uh, well, the venue is, is significant for just one thing. And, and, and for this man, uh, it is the, uh, it is the, independent, the occasion of independence. Uh, and you know, a lot of things have been said, uh, but I can only remember one thing, and, and, and it is a significant statement. Everybody says it. Let me repeat it. You know, at the at the at the time at about four o'clock, I think it was, and the last post was sounded by the Royal Australian Navy, and this is this haunting bugle sound. You know, the last post, and and and, and as it was being sounded, the Australian flag was descending the pole for the last time, and and ours was being raised, and our first governor general says, you know, you see, we we are lowering it, uh, not tearing it down, huh? Uh, and mm. immortal, uh, immortalized, uh, Im immortalized yes. that statement that we have brought about independence peacefully, and uh, and here we are celebrating the men who brought that about. And I, I, this is a scene of peace right there. You, yesterday we see, saw a police guard, the army, the military, the CIS, and today it's just people, you know, in all colors turning out in, in, and filling up a stadium. You, you don't see uh, what you would see at, the, at, at say, an independence gathering. There's a lot of, uh, Policemen standing guard and, and stuff like that. this. Just this is just so so good and so uh, uh, so right, so fitting to farewell the chief, uh, especially common our common people farewell yes. the name in this peaceful manner. Yes, you know, showing so much respect. And the citizens of uh, Port Moresby uh, have flocked to the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. The motorcade has arrived at at the venue. We have uh, school children lined up on the sides to, uh, to, we have images now of the motorcade arriving at the stadium. And you can see the crowd there on either sides of the road. Being escorted by uh, the Royal PNG Constabulary. There it is, the hearse carrying the casket of the Grand Chief, Ladies Sir Michael and Thomas and Samara. The well, you can see the motorcade there. Uh, that is a, a very significant uh, detail. When you see the riders up front uh, and the motorcycle, that clearly shows that the issue uh, is dealing with, uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the escort is uh, really a state funeral uh, signifying presidential style under the, well, really royalty. Here you see the uh, uh, members of the clergy, uh, uh, priests first, uh, followed by uh, bishops. They're the ones that will uh, celebrate the holy mass as soon as uh, the grand chief's body is received and placed in its place at the stadium and then the uh, Holy Mass will begin. With their masks, I won't be able to uh, give you the names for those uh, our bishops. I think that will be Sir John Ribat bringing up the rear. <laughs> Entrance, the hearse is right there. 
Yes, and uh, students and the public are all eagerly waiting the entrance of the hearse bearing the, the body of this great man. I tell you, with technology, you don't only have the traditional media capturing this historic day. Everybody that has a phone also and, has, and, and, uh, is capturing a piece of this historic moment as well. As the people are gathering, the people, the choir will be singing, you know, uh, gather your people, uh, gather your people, O oh Lord, gather your people. Uh, draw us forth to the table of life, brothers and sisters, each of us called to walk in his light. And it is significant that this song is chosen because as Christ gathered his people, so did St. Michael Somare gather his people from throughout every part of Papua New Guinea, from a thousand tribes, 800 languages, from every island and every atoll, the mountains and the valleys, he gathered his people. So the, the song is significant and well chosen, I think. We are parts of the body of Christ needing each other. Each of the gifts the Spirit provides. And so as we commit the, our Grand Chief to the Creator, we also pray for calm and peace in our own hearts. Okay, and the hearse is being escorted slow. by the joint forces in a slow march. And you're with uh, TV One um, as we air the uh, special broadcast of the State Funeral Mass of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare. 
at the uh, Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. A bit of a technical uh, glitch there, but uh, as soon as the footage is ready, we will um, bring that to you. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it's a celebration of the life of this great man. Uh, he served as the country's prime minister three terms from 1975 to 1980, 1982 to 1985, and 2002 to 2011. 17 years in total. So this makes him the longest serving prime minister of the country, as well as okay. the uh, longest serving uh, member of parliament in the Commonwealth. Yes. Quite a task. Mm. It was interesting what the treasurer uh, um, Ian Ling Starkey said yesterday in his tribute, he said in those 17 years, uh, he had a, 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 had a combined sort of uh, economic growth rating of about 4.8 percent, he said. And then when you look at the 26 years, he was not prime minister. He said, if you look at the economic growth uh, of, of those, the cumulative or the, the average economic growth was less than 1.4 percent. Uh, and he said, now, looking at that, if you had allowed St. Michael to have been in the 26 as well, uh, he would have outperformed everybody and all of us would have a better lifestyle, I, I, I thought. I mean, this, it's neither here nor there, whether, but just to, to, to say that and, and to, to, to uh, give out figures where, where actually during his term the economic uh, uh, ratings were, were far, far better. That's, that's, that's also a significant statement because he began uh, uh, in a country that had a budget of about 50 million, 50 million uh, uh, Australian dollars at the time. And from there, we have seen it grow to 100 million, to 500 million, to 1 billion. Now we are talking or having a national budget of 18 billion. Uh, and we can all ask ourselves whether we have really lived the ideals and the dreams of the, the, that the chief uh, espoused in the uh, preamble to the Constitution in the eight. Uh, point plan in in his dreams and and, and 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 so this is this is a question that that was going through Parliament yesterday as leaders were speaking if we are we living the dream that uh, uh, Sir Michael has, has dreamt for us are we uh, building on the buildings and, and the institutions of state that he has has created for us so, um, Peter, you carry I, I, on. I think that's um that's very significant because, um, uh, like um, what uh, Governor Bird said, mm -hmm. they did better, but we should also did do much better. Yes. Uh, the sentiments that express about building upon what has been laid as a foundation, mm -hmm. uh, and they did do it with less money that's available right now. And if you think of it, I was at the... A transitionary period where Sir McCary was bowing out as Prime Minister mm. and he came in as Prime Minister in 2002. And one of the things he did, which I thought was really honourable, was he acknowledged that Sir Michael, uh, Sir McCary had rescued the country from, you know, falling into an abyss of total madness, you know, in terms of our economy, yes. economic growth. And, and laid the foundation for him to build off. And when he was unceremoniously, my words, uh, removed from his office as PM, uh, he left behind a, a, a surplus of almost 480 million kina. So those are the issues that sometimes you wonder how that money was just dissipated. Uh, at a snap of a finger. But those uh, lessons in history, we ought to be able to learn from this great man in that it was not his private business. He was running the stateship of Papua New Guinea. 
and he ran and conducted himself and acquitted himself to the task and mm -hmm. setting uh, the way in which the framework of how we would want to develop our country, uh, how contributions can be made, even as you would say, he would say sometimes to us, you know, quoting almost uh, Desiderata, even the dull and the ignorant, they, should, they too have a say. And I think that's the, the, the length and breadth of the character of man who was able to just, as I said yesterday, embrace everybody from all walks of life and treated them as equal to him. Thank you. And it's, it's good. As, uh... Okay, so we return to uh, the live images at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium where the state funeral mass um, is happening of the Grand, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare.
task that has been placed on its stand, Cardinal Rubat and other bishops will place the Christian symbol on the casket. In the waters of baptism, did Sir Michael Thomas Sommer and uh, uh, with Christ rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory. In my Grand Chief Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Somare, cherish the gospel of Christ. May Christ now greet him with these words of eternal life. Come, blessed of my Father.
all please remain standing.
Let us pray. O God, Almighty Father, our faith professes that your Son died and rose again. Mercifully grant that through this mystery, your servant, Right Honorable Francis Sir Michael Thomas Somare, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice to rise again through him who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Please be seated. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed, in the view of the foolish, to be dead, and their passing away was thought and affliction. And their going forth from us, utter destruction. But they are in peace. For if before men, indeed, they be punished, yet is their hope full of immortality. Chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. In the time of their visitation, they shall shine and shall dart about as sparks through stubble. They shall judge nations and rule over peoples. And the Lord shall be their king forever. Those who trust in him shall understand truth. And the faithful shall abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with the elect. The word of the Lord. One thing I ask 
of the Lord this I seek to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life that I may gaze on the loveliness of the Lord and contemplate his temple.
The Lord be with you. A reading for the Holy Gospel according to John. I have glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me, Father, with you, with the glory that I had with you before the world began. I revealed your name to those who gave me out of the world. They belong to you, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you gave me is from you, because the word you gave to me I have given to them. And they accepted him, and truly understand that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world, and I consecrate myself with them, so that they also may be consecrated in truth. I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you that they also will be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. All be seated. During these days of national mourning, we are all trying to answer one question. Each one of us has different experiences and uh, memories of him and uh, will inevitably come up with a different description of Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Somare. I have reflected a great deal on this leader. Great husband to Lady Veronica, great father to his children, grandchildren, and for me, a great friend. Today, we are here to acknowledge the great contribution he made to Papua New Guinea, to celebrate his earthly and eternal life, and to thank God for giving Papua New Guinea such an outstanding leader. I have chosen three readings from the Bible for today's celebration. The first comes from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. The second reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 14, verses 7 to 12. And the third reading from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, verses 4 to 8, and 18 to 21. These three readings perfectly illustrate for us who Sir Michael Thomas Somare was and also provide us a splendid summary of the life of our founding Prime Minister, the husband, loving father, and a friend to many. Our first reading from the Book of Wisdom tells us the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and uh, no torment shall touch them. I really believe that Sir Michael is with our Lord right now, at the right hand of the Lord. I believe that with all my heart. The Book of Wisdom tells us that although there are many in this world who believe that all life ends 
with our earthly existence comes to an end, we know that from our faith, the souls of those who have passed from this life will be in peace with God and uh, have eternal life with Him. We also know that those of us who trust in God will abide forever in His love. As I came to know Sir Michael, I also enjoyed getting to know the joy and enthusiasm with which he lived out his faith, not only in the way he was involved in political space, but also in the way he lived out his faith in his daily lives. The souls of the faithful are not departed from God, who took them to himself. Faithful here does not mean perfect, but instead it means putting our trust in the mercy of our God, who himself calls us, who calls for our trust. Life can be seen as a time of purgation, like gold purified in the furnace. God does not test our faith by making us suffer, God invites us to trust the experiences of human frailty and the limitations which we can judge as suffering. Grace and mercy are with his holy ones. If we only not had known more clearly their, that their passing would be more than a loss. Sir Michael was a true believer, a man of integrity. Sir Michael is a man of history. He was a man of faith, which means grateful reverence towards the source of being, towards the source of our being, for what we have received. Our God, our country, our locality, and the people our ancestors and families. In the second reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, Paul further cautions us to focus on what God expects of us rather than what we expect of others. This extends the lesson from the previous verses on what it means to please the Lord. St. Paul, however, continues to remain in the same context of living with those with different standards. As St. Paul says, for none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. St. Michael, oh, Sir Michael, lived for the Lord his family and uh, this country, and now he has died for the Lord since he always belonged to the Lord. When we compare ourselves with others, pride easily enters our thinking. St. Paul speaks of a better way. It is much more important to capture every thought and action for the Lord, in that we live or die for the Lord. Christ is our Lord. The term Lord is, has many possible meanings, but clearly Christ uses it to encourage us to focus on his great governing responsibility. We are directly accountable to our Lord if God is our judge, why then we do we dare act as judges ourselves? Should we go up to his seat, push him off, and then dare to sit in, in it 
and judge others. We have enough to do just to prepare ourselves for the time we need to come before him. Each one of us must give an account for our, our lives before God. This is what Jesus made, uh, this is what makes Jesus' Lordship different and unique. Sir Michael is now giving an account of his life before God. And so today, our prayers and this Holy Eucharist for him will assist Sir Michael at the entry to heaven. Words from the Gospel of St. John brilliantly capture St. Michael's work, or Sir Michael's work. Today, on his behalf, we can say, Lord, Sir Michael has brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave him to do. Anyone who wants to be a follower of Jesus must set aside their own desires, take up their cross every day and follow the way of Jesus, the Christ. Although at first sight, this seems to be a demand to set aside one's own well-being. It is, in fact, the way in which we will find what is really in our best interest. Sir Michael chose the way of Jesus in the belief that it is the way of life and the truth. We can say with absolute confidence that his life was worthwhile. Today we acknowledge it and we celebrate their life. I, want, I just want to share with you well, when, when I met him on the 20th of last month, and that's when I came back from my day, and the family came, and he was asking that I go and see him, visit him. Now, as I visited him on Saturday, he told me that this evening or this afternoon, I will be discharged, and I will go home, and I will go to celebrate the Eucharist celebration on Sunday at St. Joseph Borgo, because that's where he goes always to celebrate Mass on Sunday. And so that is how he lived out his faith until the end. Jesus also warns us about being ashamed of acknowledging our Christian calling. It is not enough to be a Christian. It is important to be seen as one. We are to be the salt of the earth. We are to be a lamb that is not hidden away, but gives light. The life of Sir Michael that we are celebrating today is the testimony that he was both the salt and light for this nation and other nations. And since he knew where his true values lay, he did not conceal his faith in order to save his political life. He was truly the salt for this country and the lamb for our people in the way in which he proudly and publicly acknowledges his faith in Jesus Christ. From the founding father of Papua New Guinea, we often heard those words of faith that was translated into action. He believed that the gaining of independence should make every one of us strive to be better and to be more unified, to be better in our private lives, to be better friends and neighbors and co-workers and parents. And if, as has been discussed in recent days, his death, his death helps us in more civility in our public discourse. Let us remember it is not because a simple lack of civility causes slow development in country or test unity. Not at all, 
but rather because only a more civil and honest public discourse can help us face up to the challenges of our nation in a way that would make Sir Michael proud. We may not be able to stop all of the evil in Papua New Guinea or the world, but I know that how we treat one another is entirely up to each of and one of us. Moreover, the divisions we encounter in Papua New Guinea do not merely exist on the external dimensions of our lives. We are divided on the interior, deep within us. We need to be honest with ourselves, and we, we will see the divisions within. We are often divided and separated from the person we would like to be. As St. Paul says, we know the good we ought to do, but to paraphrase him, it is just nearly impossible to do the good we want to do. Divisions are inside of each of us, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let the life of Sir Michael help us overcome such divisions. Now, I hear many speeches have been said and expressed that Sir Michael was a man, we know that he forgives and uh, he has compassion and uh, he wants to be closer to friends and people. So that is who he is at that time and through that value and this what he wanted to share with us, he united Papua New Guinea. He united all those who began this work with him in 1968 and that continues on, and our leaders today, they are leading us in that, and it is through this very important, the values of honesty, forgiveness, compassion. So what are we to do? Do we want to become, uh, who do we want to become? It seems we are left alone in this divided nation, trapped in our divided selves. This is not what Sir Michael wished for, lived for, and worked for. He loved and worked for you and for me, for the and for this country. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples. If the world hates you, realize that it hated me first. If you belong to this world, the world would love its own. But because you do not belong to the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. And that is from John 15, verses 18 to 19. How true those words became in Sir Michael's life. He experienced a lot of hate from some friends, some people, so-called friends. But he knew that he belonged to God and thus he never gave up. Often, we base our faith on many signs. For example, prayers being answered, love being evidence, peace and happiness filling our hearts. But what happens to our faith when we enter the dark night of trials and difficulties? In this long life, Sir Michael experienced many dark nights of trials and difficulties. During such times, he continued to trust God, even when he could, not, could no longer see or feel signs that God cares for him. The kind of faith we need when faith matters most comes from a relationship of trust, real trust. Sir Michael chose to trust God for who he really is and how much he really cares, rather than on what the evidence seems to say. Sir Michael trusted God so much that he did not need to see signs. In the course of his life, life's journey, Sir Michael encountered many obstacles, 
but he remained resolute. He, in converse, conversation, he often repeated that there was no other way. We had to continually work for the building of peace and a better unity for all of us. Despite many setbacks, he never became disheartened. Thus, we come here this afternoon because Sir Michael was also a man of faith. He believed in God and his faith was important to him. Prayer was very important to him. In St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, the apostle said, the time of his departure had come and he was prepared to face the Lord. The righteous judge, he had finished the race, he had kept the faith. Sir Michael too has finished the race, he too kept the faith, he too has come face to face with the righteous judge who judges all fairly. Sir Michael's death has brought our country to a moment of soul searching and leaves us scrambling for elusive unity. The pain of the moment has, has us clutching and scratching at anything that might unite us. We lower our flag, we pray, we bow our heads in search of a thing, anything that might unite us. In a few days' time, we will lay Sir Michael to rest, and we will all go our different ways to continue with the, the bits and pieces of our life. But Sir Michael, for you and the family, life has been changed. Yes, it will continue, but it will be very different. A big figure has been taken from our lives and the life of your family, but be assured of our praise and continuing support over the many difficult and challenging days that are to come. Today, we commit Sir Michael to the Lord as we say, eternal rest grant unto him. O Lord, and let the perpetual light shine on him. May his soul rest in peace. I'd like also to uh, read out here the Condolence messages from the Vatican, and first from the one who, the cardinal who is in charge of the propagation of the faith, evangelization of the people. And this is what he said. Uh, His Eminence, Cardinal Louis Tagle, has asked me to convey to you your Eminence, the sincere condolences and words of sympathy on, on the passing on of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare. The above mentioned congregation, mindful of his merits of promoting the peaceful development of Papua New Guinea, and trust the eternal.
and that was the um, His Eminence, um, Sir John Ribat, Archbishop um, of Port Moresby. Um, the program is still continuing. Indeed, it, uh, we are actually uh, midway through the Holy Mass uh, as it's quite a long affair. It will, it will come to an end uh, shortly, but uh, uh, we may have lost the sound there, so we can continue. Uh, I think they're having a, a change of the the sentries that are posted beside the coffin, so hence in the earlier clip as it was showing, yeah, that's the changeover taking place, uh, just to allow for the early uh, the first five to replace, be replaced by the second. So it's a, it's a sentry around the coffin or the casket. Comment on the imagery. State Funeral Mass of the Grand Chief, Sir Michael Thomas Somare, with live footages coming out from the uh, Sir Hubert Murray Stadium in Konedobu, in the nation's capital. The nation is in mourning Mindful today, Friday 12th of March 2021, as we celebrate the life of this great man. As you can see from the image, uh, as I explained earlier, the changeover of the guard of guards that are uh, stationed around the casket. Uh, again, another military tradition that honors uh, state uh, honors the uh, um, a state funeral of a of a of a dignitary, and in this case, as uh, Delhi explained as the um, Grand Chief, the Right Honourable Sir Thomas, Michael Thomas Murray. And in fact, uh, Right Honourables are only awarded when you are a member of the Privy Council, and um, we only have seven. And you don't have to be uh, a knight to receive uh, the honour, as I explained earlier on. So uh, only Sir Julius, Sir Rabbi, Sir Macare, and uh, Pius Wingti, uh, and Sir Michael are members of the Privy Council, of the most honourable Privy Council, and hence they are called Right Honourables. So when the usage is on people who are not members of the Privy Council, uh, that is a misuse of, of, the, of, the, of the title Right Honourable. All others remain as honourable. So, uh, as I did at the house cry, um, I addressed the Prime Minister as honourable because he's not a member of the Privy Council. Okay. And the theme uh, of this uh, state funeral <coughs> mass is one nation, one people of God. And uh, just before the changeover, his eminence, Cardinal Sir John Ribat, um, was saying how he admired the life of the Grand Chief for publicly living um, his life as um, a Christian believer. He was, Sir Michael was a Christian of deep faith and a committed churchgoer. Um, he attended the uh, St. Joseph's uh, Catholic Church at East Barocco. And I was told that um, when he passed away on, the, on Friday the 26th of Feb, the following Sunday where he and Lady Veronica usually used to sit, they lay flowers there uh, as a sign of respect um, for this 
And uh, we head back to uh, Say Hubert Maria Stadium and continue the, um, the state funeral mass with uh, His Eminence, um, Cardinal Sir John Ribat. We join, in, we join our prayers to his after uh, and after every prayer we sing, Lord, hear our prayers. God, our Father, we praise and thank you for the gift of faith and our being members of the body of Christ. We ask you to give your spirit to all those who lead us, Pope Francis, Cardinal Ribat, all bishops, priests, deacons, and pastors. May their words and actions strengthen us as followers of Jesus. We pray to the Lord. Lord, as we farewell the first leader of our PNG government, we pray for all our national and provincial government leaders. Keep them ever mindful of their responsibility to protect the common good and the true development of our people and nation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, we pray in thanksgiving for the life and leadership of our founding father of Papua New Guinea, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samare, who has spent a long life of dedicated service in an extraordinary and yet humble way. Call him now to the fullness of your peace and glory and grant him eternal rest. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hold in your heart filled, your heart filled with compassion, Lady Veronica and the whole family, relatives and friends, as they mourn for the passing on of Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Murray. Give them comfort and assurance in his life of faith and fidelity to you, and may they rejoice in the peace he now shares with you. We pray to the Lord. Lord, bless and protect the people of Papua New Guinea as we uphold the legacy passed on by the Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samari. May our land and tradition be protected and respected, and may we continue to be faithful to your ways and live in peace, health, and harmony in these trying times. We pray to the Lord. Lord God, give our peace and the healer of souls. Hear the prayers of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and the voices of your people whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in the kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
We, we shall now proceed to presentation, presentation of gifts. A representative from each province and one from the Papua New Guinea Council of Churches will bring a symbolic gift to be led by the dancers from East New Britain.
the mystery of faith. Church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope and John our Bishop and all the clergy. Remember your servant, Friendship, Guarantee of Sir Michael Thomas Murray, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the Blessed Joseph, the most chaste spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, Blessed John Masconi, and Peter Thorod, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, may be made to be poor heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. The Savior's command, informed by the right teaching, 
We dare to pray and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come. Please all be seated. About receiving Holy Communion, only the Catholic faithful can receive Holy Communion, and the distribution of communion is only by the hand. Please wait for the communion ministers who are in the position to distribute the Holy Communion. Each communion minister 
is guided by an usher holding a yellow and white flag on a pole.
Please all stand. Let us pray. Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the many, mercifully grant death, strengthened by it, our brother. Sir Michael Thomas Tomare may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Please, Please be, be seated. seated. We will now listen to one eulogy by Miss Alciana Samara Brash on behalf of the Samari family. Two other eulogies by Sir Daddy Toka and Sir Peter Parker will be delayed to be delivered at the same time as the tributes.
covenant general, uh, Grand Chief Sebob Dadai, Madam Dadai, Kenji Prime Minister, Honorable James Marabe, uh, Madam Marabe, my surviving hero, my noble lady Veronica Samare, my elder fearless siblings, Olga Tamana Mary, Betha Sana, Michael Emma, Papa Paul, Na Kaki, Rosal Helen. Minister of State, Host Governor, MKH Chair, Community Leaders, Papua New Guinea. Good afternoon, family and friends. Adorei, Namuna Kawimanima, Una Pese. Avenue to all Mana Meriri, now family of me. Me wari to all say, Plakambo, Sam, Lisla Kaim, Loksailo, Papa of the country. Papa Lamituna, Grand Chief, Sir Michael Samare. Tasamini Homas too, Sam, you play too on people of Papua New Guinea. You play too on beginning land of the Munam Lelem. Naplanti, you play on Rata Sasa Lelem. You play on the Tokamamas, Nagim Luxai, no life, no walk of Papa Lamini. Thank you, Lily, for the time you were sent to Los Santos. I think it's so strange. No light, no papa yet, no basta yet. No man is me mila, no strong me mila. All that no belly country, no me mila. No so even passing. No be any more look, no passing. No all custom, no me mila. All one 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 people, no blame. The subject classic can say we need more on February twenty six. No I'm passing my life now. No I'm losing my happiness. Late yesterday afternoon, I watched my father, the late great Grand Chief Sir Michael Samari, enter and leave our national parliament for the last time. From 1982, when the Australians gifted that building to us, he would always walk proudly through its doors. Yesterday, he was carried into the chamber, and as he lay in state, I fought back the tears and memories of all that he had dreamed then in built, then in left for us to complete. Later I walked with my elder siblings behind the hearse as he was driven with a collection of his medals outside, out the front gates and past Independence Hill and Mary Guinea House and the museum in the distance and then onto the Samara circuit. I was proud of the fact that each one of those buildings and infrastructure I've just named were either designed and established by him or built in his memory, as in the major arterial road that is the Samara Circuit today outside our National Parliament House. I wept bittersweet tears for all that he had left behind and all that he had abruptly left for us to do. Yesterday was a hard day, sitting in Parliament, a building so familiar to me and my mother and my siblings. I heard wonderful tributes from my father's peers. Papa Chan spoke of a lifelong friendship, and Papa Winty lamented over a mentor and friend he treasured and will greatly miss. PNG politics, as they remembered it, was about strong values as much as it was about contest and rivalry. I will miss that with my father's passing. So many great memories flooded my mind as I was reminded of all my father's masterful achievements. While many of these memories were familiar, thousands more that had flooded social and traditional media were now stunning tributes and glowing compliments about the work ethic and the quality of our dear father's relationships with many of you, his people. Our Prime Minister, Honourable James Marabe referred to the late Grand Chief, my beloved father, as a bulldozer yesterday, which makes perfect sense, actually, as we have always joked that my mother was the handbrake, without ever referring to or imagining our father as a bulldozer. It's well known that my father was born in Rabaul, East of Britain province, on the 9th of April in 1936, to Ludwig Sana Samare, my grandfather, and Peinadi Samare, my biological grandmother. 
My grandfather was a policeman, and from stories told to me, he was a generous and giving man, with many admirable traits, including the DNA for service. I will never know if my grandparents were disciplinarians, or strong Christians, or even good parents. They both passed on before I was born. What I do know is that they raised a humane, thinking, honourable and decent man in my father, and for that I am truly grateful. Today is a bittersweet day for my dear family. We come here to farewell our patriarch, our protector and our human shield, in the place where he stood to raise our flag of liberation all those years ago for our new nation. It was here that he made his mark on this land, the land of plenty, brimming with godly gifts and natural resources that requires our care and respect now. My father saw this, the land that, was, that always had the capacity to propel us into the next century as he truly, as a truly politically and economically independent nation. My father would have envisaged this great wealth, but he saw this wealth in his people and not in the riches of the land and sea. He strove for harmony and solidarity as the foundation for the nation-building he championed through instinct and passion. My father was a decent man, and that provided him with the moral compass and trajectory needed to rise above the conflict that great national wealth can bring to any nation. He followed his heart before his mind, and in my view, that was the only way to truly unite our diverse country. His custom, our Sama tradition, was his rudder. When he set sail in his traditional canoe, our Muntai, on this country's life journey, he was Yamdar, our totem, that is capable of great good and such malevolence too. Sana is a way of life that my father chose each time he faced hardship and conflict. He chose to show affection to garner trust, but this enviable human trait was used against him in the end, and he was vilified and treated very poorly and publicly, as he was deemed weak because he pledged as a young man during his own initiation to live a compassionate life. I am proud my country was able to benefit from his personal choices and our strong Murid tradition. We found out on Friday the 12th of February 2021 the awful diagnosis that my father had terminal cancer. It was pancreatic cancer. My family learnt the hard way that this form of cancer only fully manifests itself often when it's too late. His doctors in PNG had discovered massive legions in his pancreas that they could not treat or remove. Firstly, from a lack of real institutional capacity and the essential clinical and medical infrastructure needed to competently treat cancer today in our country. Sadly, we were left with simply no options. I could not wish that level of hopelessness on any family member of a well-loved parent. My father was a simple and modest man all his life. Despite my own ideas about fame and the perks and privileges of sharing a high-profile life with him, he always lived to reflect a life balance I've never seen manifested by another person again in my life. Dada always played down his achievements against our plans as a family. He never held up his own massive contributions to this country as achievements. In his passing, I believe he did this with purpose, so that his prolific leadership would never overshadow us, so that we too could progress with stability, protected always by his prolific reputation. I have had a wonderful life filled with pioneering experiences, from the heady days of political independence to the signing of LNG agreements, to witnessing the establishment of two new provinces, 
under my father's fearless guidance. Mine was a life of privilege facilitated by two very decent, humble and visionary people, my parents, the late Sir Michael and my beloved mother, Lady Veronica Samari. Dada made me believe I could do anything within the backdrop of his own very high profile accomplishments. I never felt in my life that I was not enough. He never gave me that impression. In fact, being raised by this great man, I only ever felt that my life was the only one that mattered. That of course came with its own set of problems and fortunately, my dear mother Veronica always quickly neutralised the risk of us all getting ahead of ourselves. She always ensured that we did not think ourselves overtly special or above anyone else. As the Chief Minister's children from 1973, we were subjected to strict rules and household regulations defined authoritarian style by my dear mother. Despite incredible pre-independence and sole government support for domestic and ancillary staff to attend to our daily needs in the official residence of the Chief Minister at Karai Place in Baroko, my mother Veronica championed the grounding and discipline we needed as children, and there were six of us, at a critical time in our lives so that we would emerge to respect and honour rules, order and authority as a template for later life. My mother did this at home while my father took on the challenge of continuously advocating for full independence. He drove a change agenda as the political figure, figurehead so that we would adopt and be protected by the features of nationhood, including our own government, our own authority and our own legitimacy to enact laws and define development and growth on our own terms within the parameters of the then newly adopted Westminster system. Thinking back now, as a child, when we were moved from house to house with short notice, as my father lost in votes of no confidence against him, we were guided by the fact that my parents honoured process. Mary Guinea House, the official residence of the PNG Prime Minister, was a wonderful, almost fictional home to grow up in as a child. We loved its location and its charm, and it was our first true family home, even though by political design, it wasn't. In that home, we received presidents, prime ministers, royalty, and regular citizens. I'm grateful for the balance my parents struck in those days in our upbringing. We were disciplined, we had fun, we experienced great triumphs, and there was also such sadness there too. But through it all, we were prepared daily for public life and prolific responsibilities while being trained to acknowledge the efforts of staff and all those who contributed to our immense comfort. There are no words for these special gifts that only stable parents can offer their children. In later years, when Dada became PM again, we enjoyed visiting with our own children and our own families. I want to say this. My father's leadership was shared with us in such a humble way that the lessons will never be lost as we were never forced to be anyone other than ourselves. Whatever we have chosen after this fact have been our adult decisions once we were left, once we left the care and fortitude of our parents' home as young adults. As parent, our, my parents cushioned us against all nature of trials and those very public challenges. My father drove change in PNG in a way that suggests to me today that his genetic coordinates were set according to a timeless and selfless vision that factored in our diverse lineage and cultural heritage as very distinct humans. Contrary to the opinions of our colonial masters and critics, my father always envisaged us as one people, one nation and one country. I'm proud to say my father, Michael Samare, dreamed Papua New Guinea into existence. My father was a stencil for the greater good over different generations in this country. He was a chameleon with a special gift of being able to blend in yet stand out so completely when it mattered. 
I understand better at my age now what drove this man, my father, to be the greatest shock absorber this country has ever seen. In the last 10 years, when he was confronted with the most public opposition he had ever faced in his entire political career and personal life, he handled it with the grace and patience of a saint. I watched my father, the Grand Chief, consider all the obvious risks to this country at that time and the risks to his people before he worried about what was happening to him personally. For the record, at his passing, I want to say that my father was unlawfully removed as a, removed as a legitimate Prime Minister. He cared less about revenge or retaliation when the options were at his fingertips. He exercised incredible caution despite his frail state after his return from Singapore. He feared that any bad decision on his part would have had such lasting and adverse effect on this nation that he merely accepted his fate and he never defended himself beyond a certain point. I will always carry this in my soul as a guide in the exercise of power, authority and legitimacy in the face of immense anxiety, confusion and tension. My father upheld parliamentary democracy and constitutional democracy over himself and his family's future. He healed himself enough to contest yet another election in 2012 before his retirement in 2017 on his own terms. Many have asked why. The answer is that the true essence of participatory democracy was his guiding light from before independence to well after he achieved much of his dreams for us, his people. He allowed his journey to be broken so we continue with ours. My dear father said, the people have spoken. There will be no more fighting. Metaphorically, he put down his weapons. In retrospect, when I consider my father's great love for this country, I strongly believe now that he believed that knowing when to stop conflict is not defeat, it was leadership. At home he also provided comfort and solace in the face of any tension and torment. I feel that he always felt guilty to a degree as our lives were so public because of his political choices and therefore he always overcompensated in very personal ways by being gentle, loving, generous, and most of all, modest. Thankfully, in his care, we never witnessed violence, aggression, or inequality in our home. To him, his children, we each had the same rights, both as male and female. My father understood innately what equality looked like in practice. Even when our customs and our ancient traditions and his modern political profile glorified status and a hierarchy. In our home, my father worshipped our mother all the way to his passing last month. Therefore, our house was always a home underpinned by certainty, despite some normal family differences along the way. Dada understood the importance of freedom in nationhood. He felt a responsibility to provide that invisible yet real support to a nation as he embraced what it meant to be free. He forgave people who brought harm, humiliation and intense conflict as he himself had originally offered them the right to act and speak and to think independently when he fought fearlessly over different phases of our democracy for both our political and economic independence. I say this again with a bittersweet understanding of the intentions he drove and designed that now exist in our own PNG constitution. He became the driver of the political architects who envisaged changed growth and development with him. My father's close friendship with his mentor and lifelong friend Uncle Sir Cecil Abel provided him 
with the civility and calm that was needed to temper the transition from self-government to full independence. My father would fondly refer to his friend in later years in terms that suggested that Uncle Sir Cecil was a great influence on him through a period of transition that could have changed the course of our history if egos and self-indulgence had dominated their thinking. Many other strong influences in my father's life included Sir Peter Smogun, Sir Peter Luss, Sir Paul Lepun, Tony Vutus, Sir John Momus, Sir Peter Barter. There were, of course, many more throughout the 50 years of his political career. My father also deeply trusted the value of women in this country. My dear late Auntie Naha Rooney was appointed the Minister for Forests in the first cabinet after independence. My father surrounded himself with strong women like Jennifer King, Marie Simmons, Meg Taylor, Jean Kikedo, Winnie Kiap, and his own Betha Samare. In later years, when he became Prime Minister again from 2002, he insisted on a cabinet lineup that faced resistance when he proposed Dame Carol Kidu be a Minister of State. Dame Carol reminds us today that my father told his cabinet that having her in the National Executive Council was not negotiable. Under his supportive direction, Dame Carol spearheaded many policies and legislation that promised greater protections for women, girls and minority groups. As I look back, I understand my father's sincerity to this cause. He practiced the values of equality and gender empowerment in our home. I was raised to think as an equal, not as a gender. My father's parting wish to me and my siblings was that our children go to university and work hard. From his sickbed, he urged me and my siblings to convince him that we would always be okay that my daughters would go on to complete their education and be protected by all that he had already established for me and therefore for the two of them. From the beginning of his public life to the end, he valued education. After all, he was a teacher and a broadcaster before he became a parliamentarian. His service to communities built the foundation for the solidarity and unity we have witnessed in the outpouring of love and sincerity at his passing. My father was a true agent for change. He understood our people and our ways when others refused to. He was in love with the ideals of nationhood when few dared to dream with him. I saw the care my father took in understanding and honouring the strictures of the system that had worked so hard, that he had worked so hard to set up in our country. I am filled with pride as I recall his handling of his power and authority. He did not set out to wield power. He did not set out to wield the power he held as the four-time CEO of this country. My father knew and he still wore the scars of the struggles he endured to earn the right to run an entire country. My father, without the education he gave me, endured prejudice and intense hostility during a period of great racial divide in the world from the 1950s in what was then a colonial territory of Australia. He borrowed from African experiences in Tanzania and Zambia in the 1970s to mould his own dream for our rights-based system that today enables freedoms like free speech, free media and the right to assembly. I think I'm most proud of my father's courage he battled against division and institutional policies designed to segregate and demean our people as recently as the 1960s and the 1970s. He rebelled against accepting the systematic policies of racial segregation imposed upon us by successive colonial governments. Our people popularly referred to as natives were methodically oppressed and given few rights despite laws and policies proposing otherwise. My father resented the lack of consultation with our people during colonial rule. He never understood 
or agreed to being treated as subhuman. And again, to borrow a phrase, my father was a prototype nationalist. Today, as we enjoy the benefits of full independence and the accompanying advantages of rights-based privileges devolved from international treaties and conventions, we must honour the gift of the intentions and aspirations behind these nationalist protections. In 2021, when our landowners are consulted ahead of major impact projects on their land and sea, we must never forget that the right to be heard was not always a right in this country. Today, when we comment publicly and politically about confronting issues and current affairs, we must never forget that having an opinion in this country once attracted unwelcome attention and punitive sanctions. Service at shops, hotels, restaurants and bars were not always available to us, the Indigenous people of Papua New Guinea. And importantly, we were divided into protectorates and territories with different rules and laws that can't have been easy to bring together under a single system that would cater for a peoples with over a thousand tribes, languages and customs. I want to remember my father in this way for his vision and faith in himself, carry the burden of hope that one day we would define our own way in the world through effective trade and economic cooperation, bilateral and multilateral treaties and commercial agree agreements and public policies that today enshrine his perennial wish for his people to participate in their own political, economic and social development and independence. Today we are protected by the values embedded in the respected principles of free and prior informed consent, FPIC, that govern the protection of the rights of our Indigenous people through the requisite dialogue and consensus that reinforces our constitutional rights to the sharing of benefits in the exploitation of all of our natural resources in this country. My father's early vision aligns with these pillars governing FPIC and its application in fora, including mining development forums, greenfield and brownfield negotiations, fisheries and forestry and trade negotiations, and all other consultations involving our people and their constitutional rights to benefit from the access and use of our land and sea. It is the expression of these constitutional rights that my father fought to continuously embed in our institutional thinking. He wanted our rights to be signposted and embossed in the mind's eye of all foreign and local investors and decision makers who endeavour to develop our vast natural resources. He can't have fully known that we would have had the resource capacity to grow our GDP into a multi-billion dollar economy today, but he championed the basis of these opportunities anyway to guarantee our economic independence one day. Today, as we enjoy our rights as landowners or property owners and business owners, we are no longer spectators in our own land. We take for granted the right to have a PNG driver's license and a PNG passport, even a birth certificate or a tax file number. Today, we justifiably treat education and health like a right owed to us by the state or the government, but we must never ever forget that our own warrior fought hard against a colonial system so that today we would have the right to act, speak and be recognised as citizens in the independent state of Papua New Guinea. Our job now is to ensure that the fruits of this labour are not lost, that we hyphenate our rights by installing our own quality people to run good government to continue into the next five decades and beyond. As his children, we have few regrets. Our father remained with us for an extraordinary period of time to the age of 84. He fit in a lifetime of triumphs that cannot be comprehensively expressed within a single eulogy. But I want to say this, at the centre of my father's political longevity was a single chiefly skill that few people possess or will master. My father was a good listener. 
From this one great gift emerged his undeniable ability to create trust, embolden relationships, and reciprocate loyalty with grace. As a great listener, he was able to charismatically charm people whilst delivering his eternal message of great faith and hope for his first true love, Papua New Guinea. My father's basic formula relied on an innate tendency to become invisible so that others could be. His strength in remaining cordial and civil, even through the most trying of political conflicts in this country, in my view, saved our country from sliding into chaos and anarchy or civil conflict. The lesson in his passing is that we will not truly recover from such political conflict again unless we make an honest commitment to never inflict that level of internal harm on each other again. Finally, my father was disgusted at the thought of some of our Indigenous people being deemed citizens or colonial subjects of the British Protectorate and later Australian subjects without the citizenship rights granted to other British subjects and Australian citizens from as far back as 1906. I am certain that my father became fixated with the promise of citizenship and the accompanying rights he witnessed others enjoy at the expense of his own people prior to independence. I regret that I was too young to understand the reality of the bigotry he faced at the hands of officials charged with the unbelievable task of applying an extension of the White Australia policy in our land, then an Australian territory. Throughout these challenging years, he protected our family whilst he fought for everyone else's. For this I will always be truly and profoundly grateful that my father, Michael Tom, as he was referred to in those early days, was a fearless and, fear, and fierce warrior. He could never stomach the fact that he was continuously being berated in his own land. Australian author and columnist Rowan Callick referred to my father as a political survivor. In a recent article, he went on to suggest that Dada was the embodiment of our hope as a country. Callick referred to him as a daring troublemaker who dared to dream of independence from the 1960s. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison honoured our father's legacy by flying fa flags in Australia on half-mast this week, a gesture rarely offered to passing dignitaries from this, our Pacific Islands region. I understand the death of the late Nelson Mandela was the last time this honour was bestowed on a non-Australian. This is a very private rendition of his memory. I have read and seen many in the last few weeks when we shared the news that my father had fallen ill. Millions of Papua New Guineans and global friends and peers shared a memory, an event, a feeling, their sadness, their joy of independence and their heartfelt desperation at the loss of our beloved father. For this we are thankful and on behalf of my late father, my mother Lady Veronica, and my five older siblings and our families, we want to express our complete gratitude for making this tremendous time of mourning and sadness bearable for us. We are forever indebted to you all. My elder siblings have worked tirelessly to negotiate with the state the safe passage of our father home to his final resting place in our beloved Isipik province. My sister Betha in particular must be thanked for her ongoing courage in leading our family as the eldest through a series of frightening medical and political traumas we faced with our parents in the last 12 years. I acknowledge my elder brothers Sana and Arthur for their instinct in helping to guide my father in his recent tumultuous political tenure as Prime Minister from 2002. 
I thank my brother Michael Jr. for always carrying out my father's wishes for us to remain in his Sibic province. To my sister Emma for her undying faith that provided the basis for my father's earlier medical and for her well-raised children who show up when times are tough. Rodney Camus, your support always made my father happy when we couldn't. Thank you, Seki Karingo, my parents' first child. Without, my, without you, my parents couldn't have raised us, educated us, and provided for us and our, us, his children, so competently whilst attempting to run a nation. And of course, to my hero, my mother, the silent backstop, the driver, the maid, the cook, the cleaner, the disciplinarian, and the matriarch who worshipped my father even when his journey became confusing to her. To our beloved Papua New Guinea, the national house cry in Port Moresby, Leigh, Wewak and elsewhere in the country that was so well attended by so many of you, we feel your pain. Our own loss is so complete but with your energy and love, we have elevated our father's wish and his dream to well-recorded tributes that will be remembered for many generations to come. Even in death, our beloved father is guiding us, I know, to come together in prayer and in peace as one for the sake of Papua New Guinea. Dada, I thank you for finding the inner peace to carry the burden of hope always for our complex and diverse country. I thank you for dedicating your life to service and for providing your paternal love to us, your children, and to your people. I will miss you terribly for the rest of my days, yet I am filled with the hope now that your memory will be preserved in love. Dewan Tunga Papa, your triumphs will remain the invisible hand that leads us, your people, to always fight the good fight in good faith and always with goodwill. Kujanga. We shall now proceed to the rite of final commendation. Please all stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have prayed together for Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Somare, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see him again and enjoy his comp companionship. Although we will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us comfort one another in the faith of Jesus Christ. His Eminence, Sir John Cardinal Ribat, 
now sprinkles the coffin with the holy water and incensing. I bless the body of the Grand Chief, Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Somare, with the holy water that recalls his baptism, of which St. Paul writes, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. By baptism into his death, we were baptized into we were buried together with him, so that just as Christ was, was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For life, for if we have been united with him by likeness to his death, so shall we be united with him by likeness to his resurrection. hands, Father, of mercies, we commend our brother, a Grand Chief, Right Honorable Sir Michael Thomas Somare, in, sure, in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon him in this life, they are signs to us of your goodness and fellowship 
with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with the help with the assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the God of all consolation bless you, for in his fathomable goodness he created the human race, and in the resurrection of his only begotten Son, he has given believers the hope of rising again. To us who are alive, may God grant pardon for our sins and uh, to all the dead a place of light and peace. Amen. So may we all live happily forever with Christ, whom we believe truly rose from the dead. Amen. And may the blessing of the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us go forth in Christ the message. Please be seated. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we uh, uh, draw to a close um, for this uh, state funeral service today, um, I'd now like to proceed on with the laying of wreaths. And um, if, uh, if I may ask the choir to render a, um, a couple of songs while we uh, um, invite um, um, selected guests to uh, to be given flowers by protocol. Thank you. So, if I can uh, call up onto the stage the Governor General of the Independent State of Papua New Guinea, His Excellency Grand Chief Sebob Bofang Dadai. and Lady Dadai.
I can invite onto the stage the Honourable Prime Minister James Marpe and Mrs Marpe. I can now uh, ask for the Governor of NC, NCD, Honours Powers Parko. Justice Alan David to the stage. Ask uh, the Dean of Diplomatic Corps, His Excellency Barnabas Anga, High Commissioner to Solomon Islands, as well. and his good work. Thank you, High Commissioner. And lastly, the High Commissioner of Australia, His Excellency John Philp. that note, I'd also like to um, advise uh, Lady Veronica is taking her leave. So if we can be all upstanding as Lady Veronica departs the stadium.
Thank you. You may be seated now. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've got uh, a few tributes to get through. Um, uh, so, we will try to go through as quickly as we can, <laughs> pending weather. Um, but uh, on that note, I'd like to invite the first uh, gentleman, a close friend of the late Grand Chief, Se Dadi Toka, to uh, share his tribute with us. Se Dadi, please. His Excellency, Governor General Grand Chief Sir Bob, Bob Dadai, Prime Minister Honorable James Marape, Speaker Honorable Job Pomat, Chief Justice His Honor Sir Gibbs Salika, Honorable Governor of NCD Paul Paco, Ministers of State and Members of Parliament, Governors. His Eminence, Sir John Ribat, Lady Veronica, and the family of late Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Heads of missions, distinguished guests, people of Papua New Guinea. Let us give God of Papua New Guinea a glory for the great gift of Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. I have the privilege and honor to be invited by the Somare family to speak today and had the privilege and honor to call Grand Chief my friend for 47 years. <clears throat> the first time we met was at Government House where I joined the Administrator of Papua New Guinea, Sir Donald Cleveland, as a native clerk in 1950s. Grand Chief was just 17 years old and a high school student at Sogeri High School. He would visit Tony Bais at the government house on the school holidays to see Tony's uncle who worked there as a driver. In those days, even as a young man, it was clear to see in his bearing that he was destined for great things. Many years passed until 1975, when I was a private secretary, now known as a first secretary to late Honorable Gavira Rea, Minister for Labor, Commerce, and Industry. We crossed paths again. St. Michael, the Prime Minister at the time, had recently opened Port Mosby Golf Club, and as, as he wasn't a golfer, decided to promote golf by having Prime Minister Golf Promotion Committee. The committee consists of an expatriate top golfer from New Guinea, Lemmy Barnes, Thomas Tobunbun, Assistant Secretary for Foreign Affairs, and myself. We met often to play golf together. It was at this time, St. Michael and I discovered a passion for golf that sustained us and defined our friendship for the next 40 years. Now, when he started, St. Michael often hit the ball into the bushes and he missed the green and his pads more times than I could count. Through our friendship, I became his unofficial coach in these matters. Those who know Grand Chief knows that these failings only made him more determined to master the sport. His personal character, a man of patience, determination, single-mindedness, and calm, meant he quickly Gained the, gained the skill he needed 
to play well. True goals of friendship, and I had opportunity to join him on many golf trips to Fiji and also to Gold Coast Masters Games. Prime Minister Ratumara from Fiji and St. Michael began Ratumara Golf Challenge. It started in 1980s. It was all came through from the South Pacific Games and continued annually for 25 years. I serve as an important diplomatic and golf in talent development and initiatives. This competition is a reason so many Papua New, Guinea, New Guineans enjoy the game of the golf today. Golf became a lot like life for us. Sometimes you hit the long, long drive into the bushes. Sometimes you miss that unmissable part and found yourself chipping on the side of a green. Sometimes you need to putt, put your swimmer, swimmers on and fish your ball out of the water. Then you might have a day where every shot you, you hit lands just as you wanted it to. Golf is a game you can play well into your old age. I still play golf every week. Even when Grand Chief found his legs unable to sustain him for a whole game, he simply drove the buggy beside me. And the golf, he allows to just exist together in normal life, a life outside politics and the public eye. Greatness came naturally to Grand Chief. He was a leader, he was a great leader, great father, great husband, great friend. I tried, I tried my best to make him a great golfer, but that is another story. His greatness was in his humbleness. As I've heard time and time again from people that I think something that defined a man, St. Michael really saw people he greeted, he greeted every person in the room and remembered the names of their spouses, their children, and details of their lives. Everyone felt in his presence that they had been seen and heard. In our later years, we met often and discussed many dreams together, dreams for our families, our people, his support of the Motukoita people was a very special part of our friendship, which he honored many times, supporting my projects and initiatives in the community. One of my favorite memories of Grand Chief was his support was towards my son Daddy's Junior's first step into the political spotlight in 2018. When he walked into the big village, Hanobara, with my son for the first time to speak at his campaign. It was one of the proudest moments of my life. This was successful transition that the Grand Chief took great pride in. As I stand here today, Great Chief would have, would have been wishing me happy 84th birthday. And it's with great sadness I realize I will not be meeting him as usual in 28 days' time on his birthday. Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Grandchief weathered many storms and challenges through his life as a leader of our great nation. And his memory will stand to remind us of how great we too can be in these moments. To Lady Veronica, my 
Nakimila Lokau. My heartfelt condolences to you, your children, Beta, Sana, Ata, Junior, Mike Junior, Michael Junior, Darciana, and Emma, and the grandchildren and great grandchildren. On behalf of my family, we are grateful and thankful for our friendship and time together. To all who knew him, re remembers his web and action we must take. I am forever grateful to have shared the time I did with him, or my friend, and I will remember him each and every day from this day on. His death is a great sorrow to us and my family, but also a celebration, the celebration of a life well lived. Grand Chief, Turagulalokau, Bamahuta, may God be with you. Thank you. Um, uh, our next uh, tribute will be delivered by uh, Professor Sir Isi Kevao. Lady Veronica, Naki, all the children of the great men, Sir Michael Thomas Samare, all the people of Sipik, all the fellow politicians, all the people of Papua New Guinea. What a great man, Sir Michael Thomas Samare. In the old colonial eras, an era that had already been referred to in the previous remarks, this place over here on that side, Kone Dobu. Kone Dobu is a Motu word which means Kone is beach. Dobu means deep. So in this deep beach area of Port Moresby, the Australian administration set up departments. The health department, the education department, whatever department. And in the middle of all those departments, there was a little department which had the initials D-I-E-S. When I first saw that, I was a little bit scared because it was DIES. It stood for the Department of Information and Extension Services. And that was a department that wanted to reach the rest of the territory of Papua and New Guinea under the Australian colony. In that department, attached to it, was a little place which was headed by a very active man called Mr. Michael Somare. And he had a friend from Kairuko called Jack Isla. Both of them were broadcasting through the radio system and I was there as a 15-year-old boy, employed as a messenger boy, as a messenger boy and a tea boy. When I saw that little room where radio broadcasting was 
always very active, I realized that they were speaking in a language called Pidgin, and I couldn't understand. So we became friends at that point in time. That was 1965. In 1973, I finished my training as a doctor, and I graduated at the University of Papua New Guinea in February 1973. And on the podium, on the podium was Mr. Michael Somare and Mr. Gough Whitlam. Mr. Gough Whitlam was the, cha was the, uh, uh, the Australian Prime Minister and Mr. Michael Somare was the beginning of the Papua New Guinea's restoration to their own future life as the Chief Minister. At the end of that, Mr. Gough Whitlam, Mr. Michael Somare, and I and my wife and academics of the University of Papua New Guinea, including Dr. John Gantha, we had dinner together. And that's when I realized that, wow, what a strong man. What a very strong and a very vivacious man Mr. Somaria was. Then we parted. Two years later, I was posted to a place called Cupiano Rural Health Center. That was in 1975. Two months before we became independent, Mr. Somare then visited Cupiano. There he, inv he invited all the public servants, including the doctor and his wife. When we went in, he was such a lovely guy. So we reiterated our friendship again. And then I said to him, hey, Mr. Somare, my wife's grandfather, Guba Rabada, is here. He said, go and get him, we'll have lunch together. So that's how loving he was to anybody from the villages, particularly around the Motu area at that time. So I honored him highly for that and forever. So our friendship continued. I went to Australia. I did my further training in cardiology. I came back and the and Australian physicians that were looking after him then handed him over to me as somebody who I should look after because of a valve disease. So he and I became friends through the initial, the initial friendship and also through a patient-doctor relationship. There, that's when I saw him as a real loving and a kind person. Our relationship grew and grew. And then when it was time for for the Prime Minister to, to go to the Chogum meetings, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, he trusted me that I would look after him in those long distance travels. So I did that. So we became closer together. The life went on and on like that. And amazing, the valve disease that he had continued to make him very strong until 2011, when things happened and we had to rush him to Singapore. And the reason why I am mentioning is this, is that he proved to me to be a real God-loving and also God cared for his life. Why do I say that? He was there in the month of March, April, May, June, and July. It was not a straightforward staying in a hospital. It was a very complex time. During all that time, he stood his ground. There were times when the systems in his body were coming down, and I was worried that I would lose my friend. But God was, was with him all the time. There were times when failures of the certain parts of his body organs that really worried all of us, but he came out of them. And to cut the long story short, a time when he had undergone surgery, time after the time of three or four or six weeks, when he had gone, all, gone through all of these complications, towards the end, I said to him in ICU, I said, hey, who is that on the television? He said, that's Nelson Mandela. 
Oh yeah? How do you know? He's, he's 93 years old. That told me then that even though he had heart problem, kidney problem, blood problem, and maybe, maybe other organs of the body honored. problem, his brain never stopped. So that's what, what kept him going. Thanks to God, what a special person this was. I've been a doctor since honored. 1972. And in all those times, the series of complications that this great man underwent were uncomparable. I couldn't compare them with some other patients that I had looked after. I believed at the end that Sir Michael Thomas Murray was really the father of Papua New Guinea under the guidance of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To the family, you must be proud. You must be proud. It's not just his political stature. It's his love for the common people of Papua New Guinea down to the village level, which is what Christianity is all about. And there I say, he was the best Christian, and he is in the kingdom of heaven with Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saisi. Um, uh, now uh, we have a video tribute from another close friend of our Grand Chief, uh, from Dame Carol Kidu, who is uh, in Brisbane at the moment. Uh, so we will have a video tribute in a few seconds. I am very honoured and grateful to be asked to speak at the funeral of our Grand Chief, Sir Michael Samari, founding father of our nation, Papua New Guinea. No words can sufficiently express my gratitude. I knew Sir Michael informally, very casually, in the early years after independence, when Buri was secretary to the Prime Minister's Department under Sir Michael's leadership, and again when Buri was later appointed, appointed the first Chief Justice of Papua New Guinea. After Buri's death, when I entered into politics, I came to learn far more about our Grand Chief. Sir Michael was a very kind, compassionate man, and he cared about everyone, no matter what they're standing in life, and he made time for them. For me, Sir Michael made my career in politics possible in terms of my ministerial achievements. In 2002 and 2007, Melanesian Alliance did not have the numbers for me to have a ministry. Many male colleagues were opposing the idea of giving me a ministry, but some close colleagues said to me, Sir Michael just stood firm. He said, I'm sorry, gentlemen, she will be in my cabinet. It is not negotiable. He did not know me very well at the time, but he always believed in giving women a fair go. From the early days, when the passage of the National Council of Women's Act, and the appointment of the very first female minister for Papua New Guinea, the late Nahar Rooney. Um, apologies, ladies and gentlemen. It seems we have a technical glitch. Quietly but uh, as we continue on with the program, I'd now like to ask grand uh, onto the podium, he just uh, say Arnold Ahmed. The cause. And so I think back now, and my ministerial legacy is not my legacy. It is a Somari legacy because he gave me an opportunity that... Thank you, MC. Look, so long, Mama Veronica, I'm copying this all. Now, all got a family, Samare, Beta, Sana, Arthur, Alciana, 
Michael na Emma. Olga da rubla pikinini long marit. Osem emplo brother Martin na arupla. Olga da tumbuna. Long grand chief. Fellow Papua New Guineans. Listening throughout the country, overseas, live streams on television. Lo plan de hap. Plan de hap the last two weeks. Big pla, big pla. Mars long cry long papa. Now you pla bung yet. You pla bung yet. All gotta hap. In hap. What if papa go long? We work lo Sunday. I think on Tuesday we will put in the Malolo on Korea Heights. So all the Papua New Guineans, na friends, na all the Arapla, all international friends, blow you me. Holy Bungo here today long. Me plus celebrate him life long this pla. Big pla man, Papa him sleep. We praise him God na celebrate him life long him. The life of this extraordinary servant. This gentle giant of a man. The right honorable grand chief. Sir Michael Thomas Samare, who lies before us. How fitting it is we gather here at this stadium to celebrate his life. For the last time, for it was here 45 years ago, that a young, audacious 39-year-old civic man dared to unite a fragmented people of a thousand tribes into a nation. For it was here that we lowered the Australian flag for the last time and raised our own nation's flag for the first time, declaring our political independence. This location has a special nostalgic memory for me personally, and I don't know whether Betha and her family understood this when they asked me to speak this tribute today. But on that special day 45 years ago, I was a 22-year-old final year law student at UPNG, and the SRC president. So I had the distinction of being invited to attend on behalf of all the tertiary students in PNG to witness that special occasion that could only happen once in a lifetime. And I remember sitting up there in the old Sir Hubert Murray Stadium and all the ceremonies took place down here when we raised our own flag for the first time. It is therefore a very special honor indeed for me to have been invited by the family to deliver this brief, short tribute, because I am aware that many, many, many great tributes have been echoed over the last two weeks, so that I do not repeat much of that. Again, once in a lifetime event, to pay our last respects and celebrate the life of a very, very special person in all of our lives. Such an occasion will not arise again in all of our lives. Here lies a man who had a vision way beyond his time, like the Joseph of the Bible. The Joseph of the Bible was sold into slavery by his brothers because he dared to suggest to them that they and their parents would bow down to him. And we who are Christians and understand the Bible know, later whilst in slavery, he was falsely accused of sexual assault by his boss Potiphar's wife and in prison. By the grace of God, he was set free from prison and later made prime minister of Egypt by the Pharaoh. From that position, Joseph later saved his father Jacob and his brothers who made up the 12 tribes of Israel, and then continued into slavery in Egypt for the next 400 years. So as I think of this great man lying before us, a man way beyond his time, also like the great Moses of the Bible, who at the age of 40 couldn't stand the abuse and brutality of his Hebrew countrymen, in Egyptian slavery, that he took the law into his own hands and killed an Egyptian soldier, for which he was outlawed and fled into the wilderness to tend to sheep for another 40 years. 
until he had that encounter with God at the burning bush. And God said, I am now ready to save my people. Are you ready, Moses? The rest is history, we know. God used him to set free the people of Israel from 400 years of slavery. So my dear brothers and sisters, fellow countrymen, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of this great man, as I reflect on the chief's life, I'm reminded also of great leaders of our modern times, with whose lives we can compare this gentle giant. He stands shoulder to shoulder with them in the accomplishments of all of our peoples, and I name them. Sir Daddy, I think, made mention of the great Nelson Mandela. I'm reminded of the great American civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., who led the American civil rights movement in the 1960s, fighting against injustice, racial discrimination in America, and who ultimately was assassinated for this crusade against injustice. I'm also reminded of the great Nelson Mandela, I said, the South African civil rights advocate who devoted his life to fighting for equality for his black South African people. He was imprisoned for life, but ultimately released after 27 years and succeeded in bringing South Africa's racist system of apartheid to an end and was elected the first black South African president in a free election where all South Africans were able to vote. Closer to home in our own Asia-Pacific region, I am reminded of Lee Kuan Yew, an acquaintance, a friend of Grand Chiefs, who visited there in Singapore. I was told that he brought Lee Kuan Yew here. My memory uh, doesn't serve me well in that, but I'm sure they had acquaintances. An English-trained lawyer who campaigned for Britain to relinquish his colonial rule, which was eventually accomplished through a national referendum through his leadership, transformed Singapore from a developing third world country into a developed first world country within a single generation. I'm reminded of Dr. Mahathir Mohammed, a man who dominated Malaysian politics for decades. Closest to home, I'm reminded of Ratu Sir Kamise Semara, Sir Daddy made mention of Fiji's founding prime minister who led Fiji to independence in 1970. We all know the very close friend of the Grand Chief, who shared many a time a very special relationship. Being two giants of the Pacific that many in the region looked up to for leadership. As another small island states, other small island states pursued their own paths to self-determination and independence. Have. I have no doubt that given the chief's education background as a teacher and then journalist, that he would have read and followed the journeys of these pioneer leaders throughout the world and in our region, the ones that I've mentioned. Been inspired by them in his own passion and determination for our self-determination. In one of my books on great biblical characters on the life of David, entitled A Man of Passion and Destiny, in the introduction the author recounts how another author in the late 1930s who wrote a four-volume masterpiece on Abraham Lincoln, The Prairie Years and the War Years, and how that author sought an appropriate title for the 75th chapter covering the events immediately following President Abraham Lincoln's assassination, and how he settled on a quaint line from an old woodman's proverb in the, the following terms. Our tree is best measured when it is down. Tribes into one nation. In the author's opinion, not until a life is down great, great can we adequately measure its length of significance, icon, its breadth of impact, he and its depth of character. Form. The author states that what but is what true of a once for, great president named Lincoln is equally die. true of a once great King and David, up to the, younger the only man in all of Scripture to, sure to be called a man after die. God's own heart. So I say to you, my fellow countrymen, of this great servant lying before us, whose life we are here to celebrate. What is true of a once president of the United States named Lincoln, and equally true of a once great King David of the Bible, is equally true of a once humble servant of PNZ. That like a tree is best measured when it's down, not until his life is down, 
Can we now adequately measure its length of significance, its breadth of impact, and its depth of character? What a great legacy this is. The length of significance, breadth of impact, depth of character of his life in our nation's short history is nothing short of miraculous. The significance of his life and the impact he has made on the lives of every Papua New Guinean is absolutely unparalleled. The last two years we have been celebrating, been mourning children, great-grandchildren in age to this great-great-grandfather. The love and affection exhibited and demonstrated in mourning marches and house cries all over the nation, overseas, at universities, in high commissions and consuls, in villages, districts, provincial towns to this nation's capital. As many watch and live streaming today and in the next few days, is absolutely overwhelming and unsurpassed. Quite rightly fitting for the paramount chief of the whole nation. There can only ever be one such paramount chief in our lifetime and ever in the nation's history now and in the future. So a great, great man lies before us. So what are the foundations that he was instrumental in leading and laying down that we shall remember him for almost in perpetuity in our nation's history? Now I'm not going to recount those because many have. Uh, Dalciana did. Uh, many colleagues have recounted the foundation of our Constitution, the CPC report, and there's no better man than who sits uh, before us than then Father John Momus, who was the Deputy Chairman of the CPC, now Chief Dr. John. The final report of the CPC laid the foundations for our Constitution, which our Constituent Assembly adopted, laying the foundations of a constitutional democracy. They adopted and established through the Constituent Assembly, a constitution, a Westminster model of democracy based on parliamentary system of government that we proudly espouse as ours today. The constitution has laid down all the principles of a free democratic nation, rights and freedoms and responsibilities, without which, without these fundamentals, we can fracture into conflicting tribes. It behoves us to adhere to them, observe the rule of law, which is the foundation of a democracy. We are a constitutional democracy built on the rule of law. Once we violate any of those, we run the risk of descending into chaos. That's all I need to say what a powerful legacy his life leaves behind to be recorded in the annals of a young nation's history in books for generations to cherish and learn from. It has been my life's and character's pleasure to have known him and associated with him and served with him and under him as his Minister for Justice and Attorney General for a very brief short period of time in 2011. He then recontested the East Pacific Regional seat successfully in 2012 and, as Dalciana said, graciously retired on his own terms in 2017. Even in the years since retirement, he cast a large presence over the social and political life of the nation. We shall miss his presence for a long time to come. I have just two scriptural comments I noted in my handwriting. Matthew 25, 23, in the parable of the good steward, when the Lord Jesus told the parable and said to his disciples, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will set be over many things, enter into the joy of the Lord. As Cardinal Ribat and as we have been praying and, and confessing, I know the chief's own faith's journey 
Every time he came to Madang, we'd ensure that we went to Father Jan's parish at Rewo to uh, attend Mass with Peter Barter. And then our Prime Minister quoted a scripture that many of us who are believers in the Bible understand, Romans 8, 28. Everything works together for good unto them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Francie lived a, a very generous, full life. And one of the Sipic brothers said, mission accomplished. In God's economy, mission is accomplished. Not according to our plans. God bless him. His soul rest in peace. We shall miss you, Papa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Seano. Uh, if I may now invite uh, Dr. John Momis uh, for his tribute. Your Excellency, Sir Bob Dadai, Mrs. Dadai, the Prime Minister, on behalf of the Sir Supreme James Marape, Family, Mrs. Marape, I express my sincere, Cardinal John, sincerest Cardinal condolences Cero, to Lady Sir John Veronica Ribat, and the Somali Your Excellencies, family. the cage has broken and the bird has fallen free. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, today we pay tribute to a great leader an icon in the rich history of Papua New Guinea, the late Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. Occasions like this are reserved only for people who have done so much outside of themselves. It is a time to recognize the messenger and the message he has left behind for us and the next generation to keep and cherish. My first encounter with Michael Thomas Samare was outside the Wirui Catholic Cathedral in Wewak after Sunday Mass. He was a young man. This would have been around about 50, this would have been around 1965. Ignatius Kilage from Simbu, Leo Hannett from Bowenville, Alexis Sare from Bowenville and myself were students at the Holy Spirit Seminary. We were studying the theology of liberation and salvation. So a lot of the issues that we had to deal with affected the situation in Papua New Guinea at the time. There was a lot of colonial race, racism, injustices, discrimination, and other issues that affected the lives of Papua New Guineans in such a highly diversified country that it was very difficult for anybody to even think of creating a United Nation. At the seminary we had a newspaper, a student newspaper called Dialogue. In this newspaper we raised a lot of issues about the injustices by the colonial government, planters, and even the churches. We said the churches must recognize and accept 
that there is such a thing as human dignity, that people have rights and responsibilities, and they must be given an opportunity to exercise their God-given rights and create a better society. When we met Michael Somare, he did not know us from a bar of soap. He did not know us at all. And yet, he invited us to his home at the foot of Weewak Hill for a barbecue and beer. And me come and look at me plan I talk. Hey, you plan a buka, na simbu. You plan come away. And me plan talk. Oh, me plan sumatinia. Me plan school or seminary. Na me kerab na I talk. Oh, me sabe. You plan no get married. You you plan come long hours. I'm beginning. You plan good plan kai kai. Of course, we accepted that with relish. We went to his home, and there began our closed association that led to a collaborative effort between us to work for this nation. Although we did not know him, he was quite young in those days, we were impressed by his, his, by his typically Somare trait of compassion and camaraderie. He invited us and our conversation very soon centered around self-determination and independence for Papua New Guinea. This was in 1965. Little did we know we would be collaborating, Kilage, Leo Hannett, Dr. Sare, myself, with other leaders of this country to not only talk about independence, but to actually prepare the Mama Law for this country. In 1972, John Caputin and I, who were contemporaries, in school in Australia, were both elected to Parliament, and we met Sir Michael. And Sir Michael said to us, I think you people, I hope you are not brainwashed by our brothers in Australia. And Kaputini talk, no gatorgeta, mipla lo rebolia. So, he was very happy to recruit us, and we became his close collaborators in developing a constitution which, in the national goals and directive principles, clearly talk about the kind of society, an egalitarian society, which the people of Papua New Guinea dreamt about. The five national goals and directive principles were inspired by the church's social doctrine, which promoted and protected the dignity of the human person, human rights, values, and principles that are important in developing national policies economic policies, other kinds of policies, which would not only liberate the people, but empower them to become their own agents of change and development. And that is why our constitution actually talks about man being both the, uh, the, uh, both the subject, in other words, man drives things, and the object of development. So man plays a very important role. It is not right for us to be given handouts and be made dependent, vulnerable to manipulation and exploitation 
by those who had the power. Since when the election, when I was elected, Sir Michael, who was then not yet Chief Minister, asked me to become his deputy. He himself was the chairman of the Constitutional Planning Committee, comprising of 15 members of parliament who came from the four regions of Papua New Guinea. I was given the honor to be his deputy and collaborator. He, of course, he was the leader. He was the one who ensured that we worked together to come up with something that would be acceptable to all Papua New Guineans and something they would be proud to call their own. I don't want to go through the list of the people who were members of it, but I want to say that Sir Michael Somare, Sir Te Abau, Angamai Bilas, Kaputin, of course, Anton Parao, Matiawa Yui, Mackenzie Dawi, I saw him on TV the other day, I'm very proud that he's uh, still uh, strong, and many others. We had a committee that in the beginning was thought to be a government committee, but I don't, on my advice, the chief turned it into a parliamentary committee, which meant both government members and opposition members then formed one team and collaborated to work on the Constitution. Our Constitution is quite unique in the world. It is probably one of the best in the world. It's unique in this sense. Of course, Mr. Gulf Whitlam and Chief had already agreed Papua New Guinea will be independent. And they were, uh, they were really pushing that we should have a constitution very quickly without wasting time. But on my, but on my advice, I said, Chief, we are not only interested in quantitative change, we want qualitative change. You must allow us to finish our job properly. And we did not offer options to the people of Papua New Guinea. What we did was to, off, to ask them questions. Questions about the kind of society they wanted. Did they want the government to be centralized and bureaucratized here in Konedobu and were only prepared to be recipients of goods and services? Or did they want to share in power itself? For a highly diversified country such as ours, uniformity would not work. So, as you know, the second goal of the Constitution is equality and participation, which means giving the people of Papua New Guinea, in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity, some measure of autonomy, some measure of independence that would allow them to participate not only in governance, but also in development. First goal, as you know, is the integral human development. Development is holistic, not compartmentalized or dichotomized. Development and development belong spirit, the body, the, the culture, the environment, the organ something. It's a very, very important uh, notion that when we talk about development, we must not, we must not think it is only about technological development, it's about formation of human characters. People would be equipped to think for themselves. Man being a rational animal, endowed with an intellect and a will, he must be allowed to exercise his right, to look at options, to consider, weigh the pros and cons, and make his own informed decision about his life and his future. And I think that is why the people of Papua New Guinea accepted independence. 
in the big, at the beginning, people were not very keen to have independence because the Highlanders, and I did not blame them, said if we become independent, all numbers man by by bossy me. Well, he said, he white skin, all man by numbers that's all. Now I remember Sir Te Abal asking me, I was a priest then, he said, Padre, Sumari talk through, and me trick him you me. Look at them, me trick him you mean, I sink him you mean, I meet. Then I said to him, No, God. Sumari talk through, and me steer a man long canoe belong you me. And to his sin down long canoe. You know me sin down long canoe. You know that sin down long canoe. So as canoe go down, Sumari too by go down. Now me talk, I'm straight. Me now me believe. So later on, I should. Tease uh, Sir Michael and say, look, had you in excluded them, we would have had a constitution, but it would be a constitution for the Numbis. Because the Highlanders, Highlanders would say, sorry, me plan, no, we had nothing to do with it. The other thing is the PNG constitution was we did not go overseas. There is a misunderstanding. CPC never traveled outside of Papua New Guinea because I said, if we are going to make a suit for a Papua New Guinean, let's go to the village where the Papua New Guinean lives and take his measurements. It is no use going overseas, long measure I'm all man long outside, no will you me copycat, bring him something come, I know fit. So Chief, as you know, as you know, he's a man who can walk the walk across the aisle, he's a man uh, who he, he's highly principled, but he's prepared to listen. And he said, yes, we will ensure that all, or everybody must participate in this, uh, this massive job. And I think, in my view, in those days, it was the most comprehensive political engagement that the government had carried out in Papua New Guinea. And I, I just, uh, our Professor mentioned DIS. We were very lucky. The colonial government had a very effective Department of Information and, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, DIS, anyway, is very, very effective. We, we use that network to talk to the people got them to submit uh, their views on the different issues affecting the Constitution to us. We conducted public uh, meetings and we made sure we went to the patrol posts, sub-districts and districts of all the provinces, all the districts of Papua New Guinea at the time. And the people were very, very happy. I meet people today who say to me, me, member belong, uh, committee belong you. Then I, me, then I find it difficult because all you know, member belong committee, CPC. What they meant, what they mean, he said, I was a member of the committee you set up in the provinces. And it was their task to talk to their own people, find out exactly what they wanted, and report it back to us. So, as, we, as I pointed out in the, in the second, second goal, equality and participation, one of the important things that the great leader did was to set up a system of decentralized government. And he appointed me to be the first minister for decentralization and my aim was to set up all 19 provincial governments in one term of five years. Because I believed that even though some provinces may not be quite prepared, it would, be, it would create a challenge for the national government to ensure that there was equitable distribution of opportunities resources to all provinces. So as a result of that, we have governments in the provinces 
which are controlled and run by the people themselves who elect their representatives to make decisions uh, on uh, local matters, of course, within the parameters of the national constitution. The third goal, as we know, is national self-reliance and sovereignty. This calls for all of us, all citizens, governments, universities and other churches to ensure that Papua New Guineans get involved meaningfully in the process of development, in business, in uh, education, in the public service, and so on and so forth. And I think this is something that Chief, although he wanted independence right away, and he was right, he knew that we did not have adequate, well-qualified bureaucrats and others to implement or advise and implement government policies. But that did not deter him. He had a vision, and his vision was that one day we must be free. And he took the necessary steps to collaborate with the Australian government, New Zealand, to assist us in preparing Papua New Guineans to take over from the colonial officials. The fourth goal is natural resources and environment. This is a very important goal because Papua New Guinea is such a highly is a world uh, such is blessed with so much resources that it is very tempting to do things to, to for money without taking enough consideration for the et ecological balance which we must keep and so we recommended this fourth goal to be observed by governments private enterprise and others even though they are not legally enforceable, these goals and directive principles are very important. I would say they are morally required if we want to ensure that there is justice and fair play in our community. In fact, Papua New Guinea had this goal enshrined in its constitution before the famous Rio summit, which was, a climb, which was on environment by, by the international community in South America. PNG at the time had this courage to put this goal and its directive principles for us to adhere to and promote. The fifth goal, of course, is PNG ways. This is very important because even though we want to do things, we want to learn from the West, from Asia and from other countries, we are Papua New Guineans. We are highly diversified. We are rich in our own customs. And one of the most important tenets of PNG culture is the culture of consultative, consensual form of decision-making. Chief, great chief, but by consult, one them all or lesser chiefs. The lesser chiefs, of course, in consult, are in touch with their followers. So the lesser chiefs always know what the people want, and they advise a big chief of their of their views, of their ambitions, and the, greater, uh, the, the, the chief then makes a decision. It might look as if he's, make, he's not a dictator, he's a person who listens and makes a decision in the best interest of everybody. And I think this is, probably, this is most probably where the great chief uh, learned his skill of talking with collaborators with others, with the opposition, with people who may not share his view, 
and successfully mobilize a collaborative effort amongst the differing uh, sectors of the community to have something in that okay. yeah. to have something that we now are proud to call an independent nation of Papua New Guinea. And it is a country that if you want to know exactly what the constitution asks,